Okay, that um, the, um, the lunch break was a little shorter, but I promise you that you're going to have a wonderful reception at the end of this <laughs> with, uh, with uh, strong refreshments. So I, I promise that, um, um, and we'll have a little bit of a uh, coffee break. Um, and I realize that often the conversations in the, um, in the culotta, as they say, and the, um, in the side rooms and so on and so forth are important for business conferences. But, the next session is an important session for us because uh, we have two very prominent individuals in this um, in this uh, section. One, I would like to read her bio, and uh, I think, and it speaks for itself. She is an award-winning columnist, a bestseller, uh, best-selling author, investigative journalist, and that is a fact. In fact, she's reminding me that not the question of corruption <laughs> for your tenure have been on it. She writes twice weekly in something that is absolutely phenomenal, I think, but anybody who gets some of these memos that are sent around by us, um, you see uh, Diane Francis prominently featured. Um, she is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in addition. You see, she has written in all those the wonderful newspapers and magazines that are listed in the program. She is actually also uh, the distinguished professor at uh, Weissens uh, University School of Management and a visiting fellow at Harvard. In effect, and she is someone that uh, I particularly asked to take this on because it's a very important task, and that is figuring out what we could do that would be better than what we've done until now in the last 30 years in building that Euro-Atlantic vision for Ukraine. What are some of the things that we have to get rid of, some of the bad habits, um, and therefore that terrible word, corruption, that sort of irritates my ear. She may be bringing that up, but she will also be asked to, um, and we're gonna be asked to uh, also, how would she envision <coughs> The overall structure, because there are so many different issues that you've heard, or even the one that we were talking about during lunchtime here at this table, and that is uh, issues of, uh, of what EU is doing. Is EU staying the course? It seems to be doing so in security, but in economics, it seems to be doing different. There has to be some sort of coordination going on. So what we're asking her, and therefore, the best way we do the first Ambassador, the United States ambassador to Ukraine. Um, he's been involved with the Ukrainian issue for over 30 years, especially in the economic sector. Uh, he has been a, a, a mainstay of a, 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 a number of our conferences. So um, I'm asking both of them to talk about how they would envision a kind of um, um, coordinating uh, group um, in the upcoming thing. If we were to treat this as a Marshall Plan or an even mini Marshall Plan, how would that coordinated group look? What would it constitute? And what part should it be private? What part should it be civil society? And what part should be the state? Uh, and so with that, and it's a tough assignment, uh, with that, I'm going to ask Ms. Uh, Ms. Diane to share her thoughts. Okay, thank you very much. I think this one would um, Thank you very much. I, I've really been impressed by the panels this morning. There's a lot of thought and uh, being put into how to attack this enormous Marshall Plan, which we know will happen because the Ukraine's going to win hopefully shortly. Uh, and uh, I do want to, however, talk to you from my point of view of not only my personal experiences as a journalist, business writer, investigative journalist, I've written 10 books, four on white collar crime, um, and my experiences in Ukraine as an entrepreneur and as a journalist and as a I became an anti-corruption activist. Uh, after 2014, when I went back to Ukraine for for more, uh, because I was more comfortable that things were going to happen. I'll just give you off the top. Um, 
I see a, a, it's been a 30 year struggle. And I, I address the corruption issue this way. Yes, I use the C word uh, to lots of business audiences in the United States, to defense contractors, and so on. They asked me to do this. And this is the way I say that this is not a corrupt ethnic group. This is not a corrupt people. Uh, this is a 30, this is a, the result of a 30 year struggle to get out from under Russian corruption. Martian influence mm -hmm. and Soviet style mentality. And it's culminated in a war, and that's going to hopefully end it for once and for good. So, with that in mind, I think that it's important to look at the C word. And the way I, I look at it is, is uh, that you need to create an overriding infrastructure of ethics in the country. And that has to happen. The Americans have done it, the Europeans have done it. This is not rocket science, something that I've studied and written about for zillions of years. Uh, grew up in Chicago, pretty notorious place until the 70s. So this is nothing to be ashamed of. This is the way countries develop and you just have to come up with the right infrastructure. And then the games will be played in a lawful way as opposed to a corrupt system where the winners are the most lawless. And so that's been Ukraine's struggle, that's Africa's struggle, that's a lot of good. So with that in mind, um, it's a build back better idea. My history is I was the first Westerner to interview the first president of Ukraine in 1992. Yes, I was five years old at the time. <laughs> but in 1992, I interviewed President Kravchuk. I was charmed by him, a wonderful man, terrific guy, an important figure. But my friend, a lawyer from Toronto, Bob Anishak, who came over with me, got the interview, encouraged me to go to Ukraine, and translated for me. Uh, and I came out of the office and I said, Bob, oh my God. They don't have a clue how to do this. And they're orphaned. Not in the EU, not in, not in Russia. I mean, this is, we have to do something. We started the Canadian Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce in 1992. And a huge diaspora, the second largest diaspora in the world is Canada, after Russia, of Ukrainians. And so we had trade missions and everything. And I don't have to tell you that most of the people that went over ended up with their heads handed to them on the platter because the corruption thing hadn't been dealt with and there weren't laws in place. And so that has improved, but this has got to be fixed now. Now is the time. I, for instance, in 1995, Bob and I started a newspaper called Finance in Kiev, and it was going very well. I even got the Financial Times of London, who I had an association with as an editor of the Financial Post in Canada, to give them the stock market quotes once a week, which was a great backbone to the content that we needed to go with the newspaper. It was grown in 1995. Kushner was president. One day, guys with baseball bats came into our newspaper and nearly beat our editor to death. We all ran, and that was that stole the newspaper. So I didn't go back and also being a journalist, he was dangerous. Kuchma carved up the country like in, in a Russian style into pieces to his friends, to his son-in-law, to the joke. Carved it up, they paid very little, and so we know the result of that. So that's my sort of analysis of what happened to poor Ukrainians, it's tragic. So how do you build back that? Well, I think it's pretty easy. First of all, you have to have a rule of law. You might have a rule of law and a decent judiciary, a decent police force. The same will be if you're going to play the game. So that's going to happen. And the Europeans know how to do this. They have institutional aptitude, and they did this in the satellite nations after, after uh, the Soviet Union fell apart. They did a very good job. Um, the only difference is that Poland, for instance, let's take Poland as an example, 
Poland was a state enterprise. It was a typical communist country. There was no sector. So the Europeans went in and they, they fixed all the institutions, but Ukraine is different. It's a hybrid. It has an enormous state enterprise sector and it has an enormous private sector, which was very corrupt. In fact, they were both corrupt because there was no of law. So the first thing you have to do when you're creating new rules for marketplace is you have to do what the Americans invented. You have to bring an antitrust of competition as well. So strict with, with requirements that are in the national interest, whether this is for uh, private or public enterprises. You have to, the important of competition law is that you have to have both aggregate competition levels so that you don't have one or two oligarchs or American multinationals buying you. Sector. You have to limit the aggregate sector under your Competition Act. Americans have more the legislation than most countries do. And then you have to have sectoral limits so that you don't have one guy in the media or three, as is not the case, or was the case in Ukraine. So that's very important. Then I think you have to privatize the whole state owned enterprise thing, which was underway. Mm -hmm. Senachenko was doing a very good job running the, um, the the process for that, and then the war came along. But uh, you know there were, I think 30, 35, the SPF said with thirty five. You told me in an interview, thirty five hundred state owned enterprises. Okay, this is ridiculous, and that's where a lot of the corruption was, obviously, and the oligarchs would ride their way through that. You know. Poland has 12 state owned enterprises. Sweden has 20. So that has got to be a goal. It's got to be done carefully. And there's templates for that. A personal friend of mine actually was supervising and advising, he was supervising and negotiating and advising the Czech government after they became, after they got out from under Russia. And you know they said, "Okay, we've got to privatize." So they they tried to they privatized Skoda. It was a nightmare. It was a beautiful kind of company. They gave it for, they gave it away. So my friend came in with investment bankers and lawyers, and they were a investment uh, like a, a, an investment bank dedicated and captive to the government to advise them. And the people would come in to buy this and buy that, and they'd beat them up to get the best price, or they'd screen and get rid of skullduggery and the, the bad apples and so on. And so they did this for about three years. USA paid for it. And I think it's a model. Instead of, you know, just letting people negotiate, you have to have an intermediary that's ethical, trusted, and answers to the government and the government's wishes. And then you separate it because. Not only is the problem inside, but it is also inside the country. It's going to be people that carpet bag that want to come in and buy things and aren't good and honorable, aren't worthy to buy pieces of this country. It also controls overweening foreign investment. The Czechs were worried that Germany can come into Czechoslovakia and write a check for the country. And you know, Germans are fine, but you don't want that kind of concentration of economic power. That's why you have to have the antitrust in place and you have to have foreign investment controls in place. And they have to be in tune with what's best interests what's in the best interest for the Ukrainians. Number one. The other thing is you have to dismantle the oligarchy. It's rotten. Some of them are posing as champions that are going to be wonderful and help rebuild. I think you have to dismantle it. First of all, the concentration of economic power in certain industries, as well as in aggregate, are excessive for our country that size. And so, and to the extent that some of them were collaborators with the Russians who ran businesses in partnership or on their behalf, I'm thinking people like Spiritash. 
Okay, that sort of thing. That's the only name I'm going to mention. I'm trying to see if I can it. Um, is, is those people should be uh, nationalized and privatized. Get rid of them. Start from scratch. It's the only way to do it. They can come back and visit, them, but they're not going to own 10% of the country. Maybe they'll get their 1%. Big is not the problem. It's when big is overwhelmingly big. And that's what the Americans figured out. Standard oil, Standard oil Teddy Roosevelt, bust up their trust. And so even a country the size of them, so you have to start to think of the architecture of infrastructure to do the infrastructure problem, to build back the country. Uh, media reform, my pet. There's a few guys that own all of the media in that country and they control the messaging, and it's a problem. And the ones that have done uh, wrong have been that Kolomoisky has got into trouble legally, and I believe he's been nationalized. Good riddance. And uh, so, but what I'm trying to say is I know nobody wants to hear the C word, they don't want it spoken about so long. You have to talk about it right up front. And that's what the defense contract industry has asked me to do. And I did a set speech saying, Ukrainians are not corrupt. They were under the influence of Russia. This is how far we are prepared to go to continue that corruption. And now you build it back better. The Euros know how to do it. The Americans have the antitrust uh, tradition. And the good news is this is not rocket science. This is good enough. And once it's done, you know, Ukrainians are entrepreneurs. They have the highest levels of great Their IT is exceptional. The country with the right ethical infrastructure will be a powerhouse in Europe once we get the Russians work. So that's my contribution. Thank you. This point, I this point, uh, instead of uh, asking a question, I'm actually going to turn it over to um, Ambassador to do you for his comments on this issue of uh, how we may plan the coordination of this massive effort and trying to be in place the reconstruction of the Ambassador to you for Walter, uh, Walter, good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone at the conference. I'm sorry I can't join you in person, but it's a real pleasure and honor to be um, in this forum with you again, uh, Walter. You do uh, very good work in terms of presenting the issues that face Ukraine, presenting them to the public. Um, Diane, I want to compliment you on laying the groundwork in terms of some of the issues that the Ukrainians will have to face, such as judicial reform, fighting corruption. Obviously, you know, also practical issues in terms of business development. Um, can everyone see me? Yeah, there you are. There I am. There I am. Okay. Okay. I got. I got everything working here. So uh, once again, uh, uh, thank you, Dan, for slaying that groundwork so uh, very nicely. What I'd like to do is take a more of a bird's eye view of the situation. Walter had asked me originally to speak about uh, the post-war reconstruction period and how it will be tackled. Uh, Walter, I think you started out with the comment uh, to this uh, panel that uh, uh, we need a Marshall Plan. Uh, in, in certain ways, you're accurate, but we have to realize historically the Marshall Plan was one country, namely the U.S., directing the reconstruction of 16, 16 European countries. In this situation, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be one country that's going to be the beneficiary, and it's going to be a host of uh, a number of countries that will be pooling their resources to help Ukraine move forward. And it's going to be a situation of herding cats so that well, there are similarities. There are definitely going to be very different uh, difference, big differences in terms of logistics and coordination and all. But I think the best way to start uh, my comments off is to kind of outline what what the issues are that are facing Ukraine and then kind of outline what the costs may be and how some of the, the costs uh, may be shared or how the costs um, 
uh, how the funding can be um, uh, obtained to meet the challenges. Um, you have to realize, you obviously, Ukraine is still in a war situation, but the discussions of post-war recovery already are uh, moving forward. As a matter of fact, as early as April of last year, I believe it was, the Ukrainian government formed the National Council for the Recovery of Ukraine in the post-war environment. And it uh, was tasked to advise uh, President Zelensky in three key areas. Number one was to develop a strategic plan for the overall uh, movement forward in a post-war environment. And secondly, to identify priorities in the reconstruction effort. And thirdly, to be able to focus on getting all uh, sectors of the Ukrainian society involved, not only the national and local governments, but also the civil society get, uh, being involved in the post-war reconstruction efforts. So as early as you know, two months or so into the war last year, the Ukrainian government was already leaning in this direction and looking at how to tackle uh, the situation. And, and the task is very daunting. I will return to how you, uh, the Ukrainians will be dealing with this in a while, but the, the task is very daunting. You have to start with the human factor. There's something like 7.8 million refugees, 6.2 million uh, in, internally displaced people. In other words, about a third of Ukraine's population has been put up in turmoil and uprooted from their normal lives. That's a big daunting task to uh, reincorporate those people back in society. So that's going to be a huge, huge uh, 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 challenge for the Ukrainian government. On top of that, obviously, is the straight economic issues that the Ukrainians will be facing. Last year, there was a decline of about 35% in GDP. Inflation rates were, was around 20%. So you could see the economic costs that are accruing there. In terms of the devastation from the war, that one can see on a daily basis. There's something like 150,000 residential buildings that have been destroyed or damaged in some respects. That's going to take a lot of uh, effort, obviously, to clean up and then to rebuild. But on top of all that, people don't realize that there's a huge environmental issue involved in a lot of this stuff. The buildings in the urban areas, there's the issue of hazardous waste, asbestos, for example, clean up in the rubble. So these are going to uh, add to the huge costs. In addition, the Russian bombings of uh, various uh, eastern parts of Ukraine, as well as other parts of Ukraine, but particularly in eastern Ukraine, has led to two specific problems. The coal mines, something like 40 coal mines have been destroyed and flooded, and this has led to hazardous conditions for the rivers as well as groundwater. And of course, the water is very important to the survival uh, of uh, you know all living organisms. And so you know, something's gonna have to be done to tackle that. In addition, you know, uh, we all know that Eastern Ukraine during the Soviet period was the hub of a lot of the industrial base for a, a, a Soviet industry. And uh, those comp those uh, factories and those facilities still exist in various shapes and scopes in Eastern Ukraine. And when they were bombed, they released a lot of uh, hazardous chemicals uh, from their environment. And so, there's environmental cleanup that's going to have to take place in those kinds of situations. So the point that I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of cleanup. There's a lot of rebuilding that is obviously going to have to take place. And don't forget, you know, Ukraine historically has been known as the breadbasket uh, of Europe. At the same time, uh, Ukraine is a very much in, in the present days a main supplier of agricultural products, particularly wheat, corn, sunflower seed oil. But a lot of Ukraine's um, agricultural farmland, about 25% of it, some like 10 and a half million hectares, has been damaged. It's been damaged not only by the shelling, which has contaminated the soils, but it also is damaged because of the tanks and uh, you know all the military equipment that's been moved over the, these ter over the the land. So that there's going to be a lot of cleanup of farmland in order to get Ukraine back up to speed in terms of being able to produce as much food as has been in the past and to realize its potential into the future. I think some estimates claim that it'll be some like cost some like fifteen billion dollars for Ukraine to clean up its farmland. So you can see the huge huge cost and uh, they're astronomical. So the issue, of course, is you know um, how do you deal with this? How do you solve this? We've heard estimates particularly from the World Bank and the European Commission and the Ukrainian government themselves when they do the risk damage assessments. It was uh, last year, I think in September, they came up with a figure of around 350 billion 
this year it's been up to something like $411 billion to uh, uh, tackle all the um, challenges that Ukraine will face in reconstruction. But uh, I'd like to point uh, to one particular um, outline, and that's the Ukrainians' own specific uh, outline of what it will cost. And as you recall, last summer at the Lugano conference in Switzerland, Ukraine presented its own uh, the, its own strategy. And basically what they, the Ukrainian government claimed is that it would cost something like $750 billion to reconstruct Ukraine. No one knows how much it will cost. Going from the figure I mentioned earlier, three, approximately 350 to 750. No one knows what the actual cost will be. It'll probably be somewhat north of that, quite frankly, but well uh, exceed a trillion dollars. But anyway, Ukraine's uh, view back then uh, was 750 billion over 10 years to start implementing these programs. Uh, and the Ukrainian government um, figured that uh, with this, uh, that uh, with this uh, kind of uh, resources, they would focus on a number of areas. Number one would be housing, obviously that would be most important. And the second uh, uh, focus would be on tr the transportation infrastructure, airports, roadways, railroads, uh, in order to be able to to get the country moving moving again. Um, so uh, the Ukrainian government uh, also sees itself as uh, in this process is getting two things done. Number one is not only to have the government involved in this and cooperating with the external donor community, but also uh, as the National Council uh, I had mentioned earlier, outline it, it, the goal is to get all of society involved, namely civic society as well in the reconstruction process. So the Ukrainian government sees this as a holistic approach, and that's probably the best way to look at this at this situation. Now, having said all that, uh, I would say, you know, the World Bank has its plan, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have the German Marshall Fund of the United States that has its concept of how to approach Reconstruction. We have obviously the Ukrainian uh, program outlined Lugano, and it'll probably be updated this summer in an additional conference. The it, the issue um, uh, then is, um, you know, um, how, how do you how do you how do you proceed on this? And there are basically five principles. If you look at all these plans, there are five principles that basically uh, underlie all these all these plans. And those those principles are basically number one is that there has to be a complete revamping of Ukrainian society uh, in, in the economy. When I say society, people see this as an opportunity, and this goes to what uh, Diane had mentioned earlier, this goes to the opportunity of rebuilding not only the economy, but also the social fabric of Ukraine, strengthening its democracy, strengthening its rule of law, uh, as well as bringing it more, much closer into the Western mold of economic, uh, of economic development. So this is a complete restructuring of Ukrainian society in a certain way. And quite frankly, if, when you look at the situation right now, Ukraine will be the first country that can basically be rebuilt from the bottom up. And just think about it. It'll be able, you'll be able to introduce two concepts into Ukraine in a whole scale. And that is number one, the latest in terms of technology. And secondly, the latest in terms of, of uh, construction facility, uh, construction equipment that can be brought in. There are, su there are such mundane things that we may think as mundane as cement. There are additives to cement now that uh, reinforce cement that make concrete stronger, et cetera. All these concepts in terms of construction, all these new concepts in terms of technology can be brought to bear. And Ukraine could be the first modern country built almost from scratch as a result of this war. So it's something to really uh, think, uh, think about. Uh, this, the other principle, uh, let me just check, the other principle that's uh, going to be very important in all these uh, uh, plants is that Ukraine will have to take the lead. The implementation, identity, uh, identification of priorities uh, for Ukraine will have to be done by Ukrainians. That's only fitting, obviously. So the first, obviously, is the rebuilding of society and the economy. The second, of course, is for Ukraine to take the lead in all this. The third is that the donor should uh, have the opportunity to have some kind of oversight. There's a feeling that in order to uh, prevent against any kind of corruption taking place, that the donor should have some kind of 
say in terms of how the funds are being expended, uh, kind of an oversight in how the money is being used, what the projects are, et cetera, et cetera, all of which uh, makes sense. The, the fourth thing that is quite uh, obvious and uh, you know, self-evident is going to take some time. Uh, I know the Ukrainians put a, a time limit of like 10 years to get the process going. Uh, it probably will take a lot longer to get something uh, done along these lines. If you talk in time frames, I like to, I mentioned earlier the issues of uh, the environment that the Ukrainians will have to deal with, whether it's in agriculture or in clearing debris. Some people have estimated it will take up to 50 years to clean the environment out from all of the contaminations that's taken place. So that's something to uh, to keep in mind the time the time frame. Um, the the other thing is, and the fifth point I would say is that um, the uh, there will need to be close coordination among the donors, so that uh, donors are not uh, stepping on each other's toes, so to speak, in terms of the types of projects that they're willing to fund and the costs that are involved in fund, funding these. So there are coming, there are these five sets of principles that basically underlay all of the plans that uh, uh, people have been putting forth or have been examining in terms of helping Ukraine to reconstruct after the war situation. Uh, the issue, of course, arises, you know, we talk about donors, et cetera, but the issue is how are you going to pay for all this? Uh, we know that governments will be willing to give uh, funds to Ukraine, as they have been doing in terms of supporting Ukraine's war effort against uh, the Russians. But at the same time, you know, there are other avenues that might be open to uh, uh, reconstruction efforts. And some of the things that people point to is the pros and assets of, of Russia. And there are two types of pros and assets, those that are been frozen of, of individual oligarchs. You read about yachts being seized, et cetera. All of these can be uh, sold off. Uh, and the funds can be used for recon for reconstruction effort. Then the second uh, source of funding is some something like the three hundred billion dollars or so of central bank funds from Russia that have been frozen around the world. The issue, of course, with these two sets of funds, whether they're individual funds from the oligarchs or the central uh, bank of Russia, the issue, of course, is the legal aspects. Can governments actually? Number one, they have obviously frozen these assets, but can they actually seize those assets and use them for uh, for certain ends? And th these are legal issues that have to be tackled in each of the individual countries with some of these where these assets are being frozen. Uh, no one knows the outcome of that uh, as of now. I know that the U.S. government, obviously, and Treasury is looking at various ways that this may be approached. What the final decisions will be done? Um, be on this situation. I don't think anybody knows at this time. Uh, this is definitely a legal issue that uh, governments will have to uh, uh, deal with and uh, tackle. Uh, the uh, other thing that people have spoken about is a kind of a repentance fund where individual oligarchs from Russia might be willing to contribute funds uh, that have been seized and contribute some of those funds to a reconstruction effort to help Ukraine as atonement for what uh, for the war that was waged against Ukraine. Uh, this too raises issues because there's the possibility of individual oligarchs um, maybe buying their way out of sanctions. And so this creates another dilemma that governments will have to deal with. Uh, I don't know how valid this kind of approach would be, uh, even if it is valid and found to be valid. Uh, the amount of money that would be raised in this uh, manner is very, very small compared to the great needs that the Ukrainians will need. Uh, the other th source of funding will be private investment. But private investment is going to be kind of tricky. Uh, private investment is going to hinge to a great extent on how the war ends. Uh, if it's a straight ending and diplomatic and, and peaceful solution, uh, that's one thing. But most likely the war will end in a frozen conflict, in an expanded frozen conflict, with a contact line between the two parties with, in which hostility will probably still continue to a certain extent, just as it had it under the Minsk and then under the Minsk process. In this kind of environment, it will be very difficult to attract large-scale private investment. Uh, there are two threats to this kind of investment in this kind of environment. And that is uh, obviously the loss of the resources that you put in place 
In other words, your loss of investment of a conflict should erupt or should there be, uh, you know, uh, shooting across uh, the conflict uh, zone. And secondly, of course, is the threat to the security of any individuals or workforces that you might introduce into these areas. Here we're talking, obviously, in eastern Ukraine along with uh, any potential conflict uh, line uh, between the two parties. So private investment becomes a little bit of problematic, and it all uh, it depends on the type of solution or the kind of uh, peace that is achieved between the two sides. The one thing that Ukraine will definitely need is some kind of loan forgiveness. Um, Ukraine right now is burdened, obviously, financially. There's no way that Ukraine will be able to sustain paying off any kind of loans. I think what the donor community is going to have to look at is the forgiveness of loans and any kind of funding that will be granted would have to be grants, outright grants. Uh, in other words, free money, for lack of a better term to help Ukraine get through the process of reconstruction. Because on its own, Ukraine will not be able to take on a burden of uh, loans. Loans only postpone the inevitable paybacks. And that's a heavy burden for a country to take on reconstruction and then take on loans that are going to drag way off into the future. So I could see probably a uh, uh, focus on grants, outright grants to the Ukrainian government to help the government move forward. Uh, I, I think I'll stop right there. I've kind of given you kind of a thumbnail uh, sketch of some of the challenges that the Ukrainian government will face, obviously in terms of the uh, uh, the reconstruction that has to take place, whether in transportation or in housing, the human costs. Uh, I think I've outlined the Ukrainian government approach in terms of Lugano and uh, some of the financing alternatives that might be in existence. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to you, Walter, and I'm one happy to see if I can address any of the questions that your audience may have. Right. And uh, I actually do have one or two questions of my own, but I, I actually would like to hear uh, from the farm uh, several, several important issues of the maze. Uh, first, uh, you know, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Great to see you here. And I would suggest that there is a big issue. We now realize, uh, and I think the investigators really look at this notion of revamping has to be a radical revamping. Uh, things cannot remain the same. Um, the second question that I, 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 I've seen uh, that may have been addressed is uh, um, who and how and where. The, the main player is my like that. And then the third question and that was in the is um what happens there will seem to be two scenarios and I didn't think that is even going to be raised uh two scenarios that uh one is that there could be a decisive victory of that's true what we do to the uh, security people uh love you then but they think that they they think they can win uh the Hodges and the Clarks so uh that could be resolved on the other hand, you've raised a very important issue. What if uh, if we are faced with reconstruction, if there isn't that, this sort of people in the conflict zone, we've had that already with meets one and two. So, so uh, you raised an issue that hasn't been raised. So with those questions, uh, I have questions, but I, uh, I'm going to leave it to the uh, audience for their question. Anybody? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. What is the other question? Um, yes, so um, Ambassador Peter, thank you for being available. Um, the question that I have is the hesitancy of the current administration in taking a definitive position on um, what, what, how the U.S. moves forward. Um, and I've heard through my internal sources that one, the White House does not think that Ukraine can win this war, so they're going to hesitate, or they, Ukraine will win this war, but they then don't know what to do with Russia and the role that it's played in the world. Um, do you have an opinion on that? Have you heard similar things? Because uh, there's this, the US has done an incredible amount to help Ukraine, unprecedented. Credit has to be given where credit is due. However, we're at an inflection point. And why is there hesitancy? Yes, the Abrams tanks are gonna get delivered sooner, but how does this all play out? 
Um, why not be decisive? Why can't this be Biden's legacy of destroying the evil empire? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I can't speak for the administration, obviously. I don't have any uh, inside uh, view of it, but I, I can address it this way uh, for you. Um, I don't think there's a hesitancy on the part of the administration. As you rightly point out, the amount of assistance that Ukraine has been receiving from the United States on the military side has been very large. And, and yeah, uh, we can argue, and I would argue all, along with the, some people, that the assistance that we've provided has been too little too late. We should have provided a lot of this early on in the situation on the ground, where it's been a lot more different. Uh, yeah. I, I think it, I think overall, no one knows how it's going to turn out. I, you, people will be pressed in terms of saying how it will turn out, uh, if, you know, eventually in terms of a peace uh, settlement, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. I would say a few things, though. Number one, I feel fairly confident that the Ukrainian government will be able to maintain itself and the Ukrainian military will be able to maintain its footing and hold and stave off the Russians. Uh, I'm not addressing this issue of people talking about this upcoming spring offensive or possible spring offense. I'm not getting into the military side of it. The way I see it evolving is basically, for lack of a better terminology, is that this will turn into an extended Minsk process. The Ukrainians are too strong and too resilient and too dedicated to be overrun by the Russians, and the Russians are everything that the Ukrainian are, uh, you know, I, well, let's put it this way, the Russians are, aren't uh, half of what the Ukrainians are in terms of resilience, uh, dedication, et cetera, et cetera. They have their own problems. As a result of the Ukrainian strength and the Russian, you know, weakness, uh, I can see them basically fighting off to a standstill. And uh, the only way that, uh, uh, you'll get a, a, an ending to the conflict is if Russia feels it can no longer move forward or at a, it's starting to lose territory. And that'll be telling in the next few months how it goes. My own feeling is that we'll reach the point when the Russians won't be able to move forward and they might be, they'll start losing some territory. At that point, every, they'll sue to come to the peace table and there'll be a lot of pressure on, the, on Ukraine to come to the peace table. And basically what I see is an extended frozen conflict that will go on along two lines. Number one, there will be negotiations on what I would consider the humanitarian side, reuniting of families, children, a return of prisoners, exchange of prisoners, uh, letting the grain flow out of Ukraine, things that have been ongoing already. But in terms of a natural peace settlement between the two sides, uh, on the diplomatic side, that second track of negotiation, that's going to be very difficult for the simple for the simple reason that um, two things are the uh, main thing is involved that it's involved here is territory. Neither side's going to give in on territory. The Russians, as you know, have already claimed four of the oblasts as theirs. The Ukrainians obviously will not give in on any territory whatsoever. So the chances of reaching a peace solution, um, you know, that would involve territory is is not possible at all. In other words, I don't think it would be possible to get a true peace between two sides. For Russia, it will be a situation of coming to the peace table in order to buy time so they can make another push sometime in the future. And that's unfortunate, but that's where it is. For the United States, I, I think right now, what we need to do is keep giving Ukraine the uh, assistance that it needs. And I think, quite frankly, um, I can't speak for the uh, U.S. government, I said, but I think the U.S. government, in terms of an exit strategy, probably sees what I outlined is probably the way things may turn out. Um, I'm being a little presumptuous here, but I think that's basically how it will turn out. And the U.S. government will probably see this as the best alternative at this stage of the game, barring, of course, a complete Russian you know, surrender, which is not going to happen, obviously. Um, and so the issue is going to be for us to maintain the type of assistance to get that kind of outcome and then move to the second step, which is the reconstruction that I had outlined. I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but that's the best I think anybody probably could offer you, given the current circumstances that are on the ground. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. I have a quick question related to Ukrainian state property fund. 
This is kind of a very active initiative right now. And as a foreigner investor, for example, would you, I mean, you, you, you know Ukraine pretty well. Uh, and we spoke before about balance, private investors versus investing in the state fund. Could you do any comments on that? Where they are? Yeah, I think one of the issues that you're going to face in Ukraine, um, irrespective of the state property fund, is going to be the, the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises and how how they are going to be dealt with. Uh, I think going uh, in terms of the reconstruction of the Ukrainian society, I think one of the things that the Ukrainian government is going to have to face is to let the uh, privatization of a lot of these state-owned enterprises take place. How they will do that through auctions, tenders, et cetera. Uh, I don't know how, you know, it's anybody's guess at this stage of the, of the game, but I think it's going to be very, very important for the privatization to take place. Uh, this will give an opportunity for not only external investment, but for also internal development of Ukraine society, business environment, much better. Uh, you know, I'll take your question a little bit broader than just the state property fund and the state owned enterprises. I would say this, people should look upon Ukraine as a great opportunity for investment and uh, it's not going to be, you know, you ha I'd have to say, I'm sorry that Ukraine obviously is going through a war situation, but given the war situation, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, there's a great opportunity to rebuild this society. And any private investors that come in uh, will have a great uh, role in rebuilding that society and will be part of history. So I think there are a lot of opportunities that are really, really existent at this time uh, as you move forward with reconstruction. Just one, and then I'm going to add one question. Uh, Volodymyr uh, in your opinion, is there any acceptable scenario where uh, Vladimir Putin goes back to just being president of uh, a peacetime president of uh, the Russian Federation? <laughs> And uh, promoters of genocide, like uh, Putin's brain, Alexander Dugin, or Artem Gasparian, or Timofey Sergeyev, and a whole host of others, promoters of genocide, they just go back to being uh, leading thinkers in Russia. Yeah, you know, that, that's a very good question. Um, there's been a tendency uh, for observers to kind of see the situation in Ukraine, the war between Russia and Ukraine, as a result of an authoritarian figure, namely Putin. Um, I, I think we have to be very careful. Uh, there is a lot of support for what uh, Putin has been doing, because this is more than just an, an individual. This is more of a systemic issue. I think Putin's article of July of 2021, in which he outlined that in his view that Ukraine does not exist and never existed as a people or as a, or as a country kind of um, mirrors a lot of the feeling of a lot of sectors in Russian society uh, as well. And so this is more than just a systemic thing. And this is why I mentioned earlier, it would be very difficult for the Russians to give up territory. You have to realize that that part of Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine had been part of the Tsar's empire and obviously of the Soviet empire for almost 300 years. Uh, and uh, the Russians, uh, in terms of their history, their identity, have seen this part and parcel of their domain, so to speak. And th I think this view is, uh, is something that's shared through a lot of the spectrum of Russian society. So I, I can't see anything going, going back uh, in terms of uh, if you remove Putin or if you, uh, you know, change or that Putin may change his mind, I think this is a little bit of a systemic thing that's going to take a while to uh, work itself out. Uh, it's, it's identity and territory that we're involved with here, territory that's been held for 300 years prior to Ukraine's independence, and I'm talking about Eastern Ukraine, and identity, as you well, as you well know, that uh, both societies share their uh, Slavic roots and Christianity in uh, uh, Kiev and Rus and, uh, you know, in, in the Christianity 988. So there's a lot of intermixing of history, culture, uh, as well as identity here. 
uh, that the the Russia historically has not been able to let go. But you know, I'm I'm always the optimist. I think as time goes on, the two societies will find their separate spheres and they'll be able to live in peace. But that's we're still a long way off from from there at this stage. Well, then I'm going to ask that last question because uh, the way I uh, see it is. Uh, I, you threw a, a, a bit of a curveball at the end with the uh, notion that uh, um, you're seeing it as a, a, a sustained time. Well, I'm going to have both you and Diane to address this. But Diane wrote a wonderful, as great to you, the comments she is. She's looking at the Korean solution. And I actually am going to do a takeoff on that Korean solution, and that's both of you. Uh, given the fact that even if you have that terrible worst case scenario, you hear the arc getting into the dark scene by saying it's going to extend. Um, is there a possibility that there's going to be a line of conflict like the demilitarized zone, but beyond that, Ukraine can rebuild a ground up? And if we were doing ground up, if you were looking at it, I'm going to ask that same question I asked of both of you. And uh, basically, answered it. Who takes the lead on this in, in terms of the world? Um, unless the world wants to give up on um, that part of Ukraine that is very healthy, that 90% that isn't being held by the Russians. Uh, who should take the lead of, of, of these six? The entrepreneurs in Ukraine, the entrepreneurs in the West, the EU, that herd of cats that you've been talking about, the US, perhaps the IFIs. Or even civil society in Ukraine, so it's sort of building from the ground up, sort of also large uh, Of those six, which of those six would you say is the uh, might be and very quickly? Is running out of time, but it's a broad question. Time, uh, you you broke up. Uh, you mentioned six. Uh, they will take the lead in say in what? In entrepreneurs, Western entrepreneurs, uh, Ukrainian entrepreneurs, EU that heard gas. Right, right. But they take the lead in what? In reconstructing Ukraine. Uh, in sort of take the lead in terms of um, coordination. In terms of, or is that whether they all have that? Is there a kind of coordinating overview that that can be, or is this going to be everybody doing it on? Look, I I think uh, if I understand your question, you're still breaking up. I think uh, of all the elements that you outlined, the United States is going to have to take the lead and coordinate this uh, because because this going to. Ukraine's going to have to do a lot on its own, quite frankly. I mentioned uh, under those five principles, for example, Ukrainians will have to identify, you know, priorities, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to have to motivate and get their civil society involved. But there's only one entity that can bridge the gap of the external and internal, the internal one being the Ukrainian situation, the external being the donor community and, and the broader international community. And that's going to be the United States. The United States has been key to Ukraine's success on the battlefield, and Ukraine's in the United States is going to be key to the success of, of Ukraine uh, in uh, the post-war situation. The, the United States, I think, is going to be the only country that's going to be able to do a number of things. It's going to be able to generate the funds on its own. It's going to be secondly, it's going to be possible to uh, to uh, uh, get other countries to generate the funds. Uh, thirdly, it's going to be the only country that's going to have enough influence with the Ukrainian government to have the Ukrainian government move in the right direction. And fourthly, by giving uh, the umbrella over the whole process to the Ukrainian government, it's the U.S. presence and our reputation as a business society and a transparent society is the only one that's going to be able to give a lot of uh, confidence to the outside private investment community to get involved in the country. So, yes, I would look to the United States to be the, the main uh, factor in any post-war uh, reconstruction. I think I got your question right there. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the U.S. is the guarantor of security, ultimately. Also, the uh, role model for building an ethical infrastructure to rebuild that place. Also, the richest. But I think the European Union is going to play a very incredible role because I think people don't appreciate, yes, it's it's very annoying and it's over-regulated and it's hurting shit cats, but they have done this before. Uh, they have been midwife to the satellite, the Soviet satellites, and turned them beautifully around. And before that, they were the midwife to the 
the Southern European dictatorships of, of Italy and Spain and Portugal and turn them around. So they know how to do this. They, it's, it's ponderous, it's slow, but I think it's an unbeatable combination. And I think Ukraine's very fortunate. And then also to your Korean point, uh, which is something I think that um, Korea had an armistice between China and the West that may be in the works now uh, with China leaning on Russia, hopefully we don't know. Um, but that's wishful thinking probably. Yeah, no, no, but uh, the point is it's an armistice. They never signed peace. It's held for 70 years. And to extend the metaphor, I think Ukraine could be South Korea, which by the way, is going to overtake Canada in economic size this year. So this would be a very nice, and, and to push the metaphor even more, Russia is the pygmy kingdom. <laughs> All right, um, I'm, I'm just I'm delighted. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm sorry that we have to talk, but we do have to do that. So uh, I'm, uh, I thank um, both of our guests, and I want to be very quick about this. Our, we're going to be asking our next panel very quickly to get up uh, and join us. Um, thank you, Diane. I realize that we really have to uh, stack these things one after another. So, um, imagining a big plan to coordinate a uh, group has been finished, we now go on to focus session three, assessing what group, where, and how in the energy section. The chair is going to be Nil Rabi. You've heard from him today. Uh, we are going to be joined. By um, by Zoom by Robert Bench. We're going to also be by uh, by a senior fellow from uh, Jamestown, uh, Miss Margarita Simova, who's been in several of our our get-togethers. And I think we are being joined by Mr. Kizik, uh, Artist Kizik, as well. Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. So, Artist, could you join us as well? Uh, Mirren is like um, uh, Lel, and just very quickly, Mirren, like Lel, has been with us so many times. Mirren, you were with us, and in the original, you were a veteran of the 2005. Were you with us? Yes, I am. Yeah. yeah. So, um, um, probably one of the finest lawyers to practice uh, the uh, sort of uh, the um, mergers and acquisitions situations um, in both uh, the states and in Ukraine. Knows Ukraine better than interest, not anybody I know, and also knows the energy section. I've always been impressed with how thoroughly you know the energy section. So, with that, I'm just going to let you run the session. Okay. All you well, thank you very much. Uh, one, are Rob and Margarita online? Margarita, it's about your head, Charlie. Yes, we are. I am. And Rob is online sure. too. Okay, and uh, is Mr. Bench also online? Or? I'm I'm here. Yep, he's here. He's here. Wonderful. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a plus for modern technology. I'm happy to say that. Um, I think it would be helpful before we start, uh, just for everyone to briefly introduce themselves. Uh, myself. Walter, you're always giving me a lot of credit. Uh, yes, I do a lot of energy in Ukraine and abroad, basically an attorney uh, and uh, very focused on, uh, on Ukrainian uh, energy and infrastructure. Uh, Oris next to me is our king of finance, and uh, he's been, uh, what would I say? He's been, he's got over 35 years of financial services experience and has worked with Morgan Stanley, the New York Stock Exchange, Lehman Brothers, American Express. Uh, and uh, he has worked very closely with Ukraine. And he 
in the early 90s, he advised the newly formed Ukrainian government on economic policy and uh, was a liaison with the financial services community. And uh, currently, he's a managing partner at Long K Associates and advises certain clients, uh, his select clients on business expansion, growth strategies, private placements, et cetera. And uh, some of that discussion always turns to Ukraine and there are potential investment opportunities there. So I think you are well placed to discuss private capital and financing, particularly in the energy sector. Uh, Rob is an old friend, colleague, and, uh, and client, uh, king of Ukrainian energy in the private sector space. Uh, he's invested and helped companies invest uh, both in South America and the United States, but primarily in Ukraine. And not only as, and he has a lot of in-country experience, not only dealing with the upstream oil and gas sector in Ukraine, but also uh, he has the unique, unique viewpoint of having been on the Naftagas supervisory board, board of directors. Uh, so he has a very much an insider's view, both from the private sector and the government. Uh, Margarita, as you know, is a regular contributor to the Jamestown, uh, Jamestown publication, Eurasia Daily Monitor, and a very prolific author on books and chapters and articles, also on energy security and democracy, uh, both in the, in the Balkans and Central Asia and Ukraine. So that's us in a nutshell. And this is the energy panel. So we've had very interesting panels, optimistic panels, perhaps some not so much. <laughs> and uh, I think we need to start. I think our panel is going to be sobering because, Lev, you raise a very good point that everybody wants Ukrainian agriculture. And I was talking with Rob just before. Nobody wants Ukrainian energy. It's an issue for reconstruction and further development. And all of us need to consider around the table and that's what we're gonna talk about. There's obviously the immediate need to reconstruct energy infrastructure. And that's a massive undertaking. Uh, and then there's the further need to develop infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And what we would like to talk about in this panel is maybe focus less on the immediate need of reconstruction, but think about what comes next. Because if we reconstruct, then that brings us to you know, January, 2022. And we have problems in the energy sector then, right? Lev on the agriculture side, you know, the bottlenecks on freight cars, ports, Financing, that's a conference topic for the last 20 years. And a lot of the issues that we raise here, you know, we, we can pick up our presentations from five, 10 years ago and raise them again, but the issues become more and more acute. So without much further ado, I do want to briefly introduce the energy sector in Ukraine and what that really means. And we have to think not only of electricity and the electricity grid, that's the reconstruction issue that's gotten a lot of press and certainly a crisis issue. But next we have nuclear, which obviously has raised a lot of issues because of uh, uh, the South Asia plant. We have coal, we have renewables, we have the pipeline system, uh, we have natural gas and oil. Processing facilities are like thereof. And we have hydro. So those are a lot of issues to discuss in a very brief time frame. But I would like very briefly to run for two minutes to run through some thinking, some bullet points in terms of what is out there 
And then we're going to lead our experts to follow through. So on the electricity grid and the electricity, we're rebuilding. Diane, you raised the issue of oligarchs. Well, the electricity infrastructure is run by oligarchs. It's DTEC, it's RCG, it's Akhmetov and Firtash. Are we helping them? Are we beyond that? Uh, we have the European energy grid, we have European integration, uh, the electricity grid, balancing imports and exports, uh, European connectivity capacity issues, the export of electricity, the import of electricity, uh, problems with joint auctions. And I'll talk through that. On nuclear, we have Westinghouse and Holtec wanting to invest, in, Westinghouse actively investing, Holtec hoping to invest. We have Europe's largest nuclear facility under occupation. Uh, we have coal and upstream oil and gas in Eastern Ukraine, which raises the issue of whether a frozen conflict is viable for the energy sector. How can you develop the energy sector if, that, if those regions of the country where natural resources are most abundant could face consistent attack. How can you invest and rebuild? And that leads onto renewables because the renewable sector, which was growing and struggling, has been destroyed. Solar stations, wind energy, that's a disaster now, right? Taken over or destroyed by the Russians. How do we rebuild that? And you know that's both. It's an investor intense. And we have the pipeline storage issues, pipe, our pipeline facilities and gas storage. We're glad that Europe has turned to Ukraine as a storage facility. It's great that the EU Energy Secretariat has approved certification of Rupert Transgas going forward as a storage operator. Uh, but we have to look at the economy. We have to look at reverse transit flows of uh, natural gas rather than from Russia to Europe and from Europe into Ukraine. Uh, the reverse transit and the capacity of pipelines to transit that into Ukraine and what we are transiting out. Uh, think about European consumption, uh, consumption issues and the availability of LNG coming into Ukraine, whether it's through Poland or elsewhere. Uh, and lastly, uh, well, hydro is an issue. We got to, uh, if the majority of Ukrainian hydroelectric power came, comes from the Dnipro, particularly from the from the dam in Zaporizhia, etc., that's also uh, a, a conflict. Does not resolve that issue. You can't improve. hydro is good, cheap, clean energy, uh, and you can expand that, but you need peace on the Dnipro to, to develop it. And then we go to the issues that a lot of the, we just had on the last panel, natural gas and oil, nafta gas and uber nafta. Uh, what do we do with them? They are state owned, state owned enterprises. Do we allow for privatization? Is it viable? Are we floating bonds? Are we uh, engaging in privatization? What do we want to do? So with those thoughts, I would like to turn to our panelists and uh, you know, we've talking about the what, the who, the how, the where, the when. Uh, perhaps out of deference to people who are on electronic mode and may <laughs> fizzle out or not, hope the connectivity works. Uh, and uh, and do deference, Margarita. What are your thoughts on some of these issues that we've talked about? Thank you, Miron. I, I am not the best uh, specialist on Ukrainian energy. I've been following, of course, developments. And yes, you are absolutely right. Um, the uh, renewable energy sector has been destroyed and it's mostly based in Eastern, <coughs> in Eastern Ukraine where uh, the Russians are controlling that, in that sector, that territory at the moment. So a lot will depend on the uh, end of the war and how that war is going to end. But I'm not pessimistic about the end of the war. And I think that uh, the U Ukrainian forces are making 
a very good progress now on the east part of the Dnipro River and going into uh, the land bridge to Crimea. So in the next few weeks, we are going to see uh, a lot of developments that are going to, uh, to decide the exit, uh, the uh, end of the war and how, how it's, it is going to be agreed to, to end eventually. Of course, uh, if any territories remain under Russian occupation, this is going to be a big uh, detrimental effect uh, to the Ukrainian energy sector because oil and gas deposits are there, because the solar uh, capacities and the wind capacities were developed there, because the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is under occupation. <clears throat> but that might change, might change and might change very quickly. Uh, so we cannot predict how this is going to end. But what we can say is the moment, when the moment comes for Ukraine to start reconstruction of its energy sector, the country needs to, to think about reconstruction and restructuring and further development into a viable uh, sector based mostly on uh, clean energy, what it's going to be nuclear, what it's going to be hydro, what it's going to be solar. There's so many ways to, to develop uh, different uh, clean energy capacities. But uh, you're right, we cannot go back to, uh, to, the, the, to the past. And uh, Ukraine, and as every other European country, cannot rely on coal as much as these countries relied before. So it's not going to be an easy process. But uh, investment in developing of clean energy is going to be a key. And here I want to talk about something that uh, is very much uh, discussed in, in currently about green hydrogen. You need energy to produce energy. You need energy to produce hydrogen. And Ukraine actually has a, a big advantage of having several nuclear power plants, which can be used as a natural source of, uh, of heat, of energy, for production of uh, hydrogen. Uh, because otherwise they have to be solar capacities built and they have to be wind, wind capacity, capacities built in order to break the water molecule and produce hydrogen for energy. Um, so this is going to be investment for production of, of energy that, you know, this energy that solar and, and wind produce can be used uh, by itself and not to be, um, to be used for production of hydrogen. But nuclear power plants are great, a great option to produce a lot of hydrogen. Uh, how this is going to be transported to any European countries in the future is another question that needs to be discussed and needs to be studied. Uh, hydrogen molecules are very small. The uh, pipelines, uh, that the gas pipelines at the moment, they're not well insulated to, uh, to trans transit um, um, hydrogen in gas um, form. Maybe we should, uh, we should think about liquid um, uh, form of transportation of hydrogen. Well, these are so many questions to be, to be answered, but I wanna stop here and say uh, the, the direct damage to the Ukrainian energy sector is estimated to be uh, over $8 billion that figure might turn out to be higher because the energy sector was particularly targeted by uh, the Russian forces for destruction. Um, and for one particular reason to put Ukraine on its knees and to, to push the West to negotiate a peace deal that is uh, beneficial to Russia. And uh, uh, Timofey Milovanov recently said that this is going to be the cost of rebuilding, of building two new uh, Hoover dams in, in Ukraine, uh, a huge amount to invest. Uh, but uh, uh, apparently, first thing, the first order of business is restoring connectivity of the energy system, which uh, uh, the, uh, the workers of the energy companies have been doing so well in the last, in the last one uh, plus year. They've been reconnecting the uh, the grid so quickly that it's amazing what they have achieved, risking their own lives to, to do so. Uh, but uh, um, we know that the strikes continue and um, there were oil depots, petrol depots that were destroyed last night in the Western part of Ukraine. So this is not a 
um, process, this is not an attack that has ended. It, uh, apparently, it continues. So the defense, the protection of those energy facilities, plus reconnection and restoration of uh, of these uh, um, capacities is number number one priority. In order to have any kind of economic development, including agriculture, uh, agricultural products that are so much needed around the world now. We know Ukraine is delivering 50% of the uh, of the World Organization for uh, for poverty reduction, the foods that that are being uh, distributed by the United Nations, 50% of this was coming from Ukraine. For each of these activities, we need to have <clears throat> we need to have reliable energy, and and this is the the only way to do it to reconnect the capacities and then think about a process of development uh, that is a new development, a new strategy for development of Ukraine. It's no longer good enough to have 25% of energy from renewable energy sources by the year 30, uh, 2035. It is going to, to have to be increased a lot more than that because instead of investing in the old coal capacities, the country can invest in, in new um, renewable energy capacities as well as developing its um, uh, nuclear power uh, stations and uh, expanding the reactions, the reactors that that were changed with West, Westinghouse fuel. Uh, they're using Westinghouse fuel, more, more, most of them, and they are also being replaced, the old reactors with, with uh, new modern reactors. So that said, uh, and Miron already mentioned that, what would be the role of the oligarchs in this sector? It's so easy for the energy sector to be uh, exploited and to be subjected to corruption by uh, the oligarchs who used to who used to uh, to own a lot of those and still own a lot of those capacities. I don't think that they're oligarchs anymore. Oligarch is when you have political party and you have a control over media and you have your own sources of uh, of income through big businesses. I think the, this uh, chain of ownership has been destroyed and there will be rich people in Ukraine that will have to invest in the energy sector as well. The question is how transparent this process is and how well um, uh, accounted it is by the government of Ukraine. I'll stop here and say, if, if the oligarchs are, are not, uh, or corrupt oligarchs are not isolated from this process, if we don't see Western investment this can have detrimental effect to the society, which has managed to move to another stage of development with much weaker oligarchs who lost a lot of their Marita. property and lost power too. Margarita, we, uh, I agree with you. And on that comment on the oligarchs, uh, I'm gonna have uh, Rob, since you've dealt with so many of them, I think it would be very interesting to have a viewpoint, your viewpoint both in having to sit across the table and strike deals with them in the private sector and both uh, dealing with them uh, through NAFTA, Haas and Nuclear NAFTA. So uh, what are your thoughts on reconstruction and uh, what next? Well, I'd like to remind everybody that oligarchs are a function of corrupt public officials. Uh, and I, that it, it always seems to me that that's the first thing people forget when they are having a discussion about how odious the oligarchs are. Oligarchs are enabled by uh, officials within the OP or the cabinet or wherever it may be. Uh, and, and that's why you have oligarchs. Uh, I, I don't know any business person that walks into an office and says, I want to pay you $50 million. It never happens. You know, business people, uh, Business people want to make money. And with regard to reconstruction in Ukraine, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, you could give the same presentation that you gave five years ago, 10 years ago. I've been in Ukraine since 1999. And I will say this, and I, I hate to be critical of Ukraine given where we are today, but uh, we could do better. And I would expect us to do better uh, with regard to reconstruction. and and. Based on that, uh, it seems every other week or so I get a phone call from uh, industry because every time a Ukrainian uh, 
CEO of Naphtha Gas or, or public official goes to the Hill or goes and speaks to Exxon or Chevron, I get a phone call. And I get that phone call because I've been in Ukraine, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, longer than any other American in the energy sector. And uh, the phone call is always the same. You know, what do you think? What and, and, and the only groups that I see that are attracted to Ukraine going forward are the service industries, the companies like Baker Hughes, Halliburton. From an energy standpoint, Ukraine is not attractive from an upstream standpoint only I, other sectors I can't address as well but from an upstream standpoint there is a significant amount of gas here in the United States that is a lot easier to produce both economically and uh, from a from a political standpoint than assets in Ukraine so you have to ask yourself what's the best uh, what's the best opportunity set in the upstream sector for Ukraine and I agree with Ambassador Papaduke. You're going to have to look at all these state-owned enterprises and really take a hard look and, and, and assess what's best for the country. You know, I've I've always been an advocate of, of you know a pretty open marketplace. I don't believe that state enterprises should exist. Uh, I they don't work. Uh, I I think that you know, run the gamut of state enterprises, they should all be broken into parts, they should all be auctioned off. I know from my experience at Naphtha Gas and my experience in the sector for 20 plus years that the asset base within Naphtha Gas and or let's look at the, the macro of Ukraine in general, it's better off being developed by private enterprise. Ukraine when I, when I look at Ukraine as a business, production has declined year over year. It has not increased at all. And unfortunately for the CEO and the, and the Naphtha Gas Board, they, they, they have five masters. You know, they have to increase production. They have to increase the amount of, uh, of reserves that they have. They have to pay a dividend to the state because they are a, an, an enormous business. It's, it's impossible. It's not, you can't do all three things uh, and become energy uh, independent of Russia and or of uh, the EU. And what is one of the major reasons we've all touched on it, it that we believe that this war occurred is energy. Uh, Pre President Putin uh, attempted to bring Europe to its knees with regard to energy supply. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate in the sense that we had a warm winter and a lot of LNG came into, a lot of US LNG and, and Qatari LNG came into Europe uh, and, and stocks are high. Gas prices are low in Ukraine right now and gas prices are low in Europe because Europe and Ukraine right now are flush with gas. And it, but what happens in November, December when it starts getting cold, there'll be a panic again and you'll start seeing gas prices increase. So uh, from a reconstruction standpoint, you will see a lot of the service companies coming in and knocking on the door to develop Ukrainian reserves. The most of the Ukrainian reserves, which are very significant, are difficult to produce. They will require horizontal drilling. They'll, they'll require a significant amount of flat fr uh, fracking, multi-well completions. Uh, those are that is expertise that does not exist in Ukraine readily available in Ukraine. You have had naphtha gas has been successful doing a, a lateral. Uh, it was more of a directional well than it was a lateral well. They've had they've done some fracking, but not to the extent that you see in other countries where there's a significant amount of gas that's being produced. And so I, I, I would think that the, the the Chevrons, the Shells, the Exxons, they will not enter uh, Ukraine no matter how attractive reconstruction is. It's the smaller companies that will be coming in, and with regard to the oligarchs, I agree with Margarita. Well, I don't know if I agree with Margarita that there's no more oligarchs, but you are right with regard to the definition of oligarchs. They, they likely don't exist at this point anymore. Uh, we do have significantly uh, wealthy Ukrainians. Myron, you had touched on Ekmetov and uh, Furtash. Both of those businesses have had significant damage to their infrastructure, and both of those businesses have been out there getting shot at and restoring the grid, restoring uh, 
gas so people could get heat the, the following day after uh, after a bombing. And those companies, whether you like it or not, are owned by two individuals that if they want to see capital come in to invest in their businesses, they're going to have to conform to Western standards of reporting and transparency, Western governance. They're not going to be able to raise a significant amount of money to repair the grid, to repair the pipeline systems, to be unless they unless they do that. The United States is horrible at reconstruction. We have Iraq, we have Afghanistan. You know, the, the last time they were probably good at reconstruction was the Berlin Airlift. Now, for 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 reconstruction to be successful in Ukraine, I can only speak to the energy sector, and and I would expect a significant amount of transparency and corporate governance and real companies coming to the country to be able to develop it. Uh, you, you, you pointed out earlier, you know, it's a sober, it's a sober topic. Uh, and I do not want to lump on and, and, and blame anyone or point fingers or anything like that. I'm, we're, we're all well past that. It's been a horrible year for all of us. Uh, my, my belief and my hope is that, uh, there's some real sober discussions. There's that the ego is put aside and there's no desire to create a, a state champion in energy or water supply or whatever. They, I, I think after 25 odd years, Ukraine has to realize that state enterprises do not work and that something needs to change and reconstruction is that opportunity to do it. Well, thanks Rob. Actually, and uh, on that note, Forest. Am I alive? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Rob, thank you so much for that because I uh, agree with 110% of everything that you said. Um, just uh, and sobering, I think, is the right word for the panel. Um, my expertise does not lie in energy. Um, I'm a pragmatist. I grew up on the sales and trading side of the business. We make instantaneous decisions that yields a particular result. And everything that we're talking about here today is about the something and the war ending so we can start reconstruction. Well, you can't put life on hold. Life has to continue. And Diane, I thank you for bringing up the C word. I call it uh, the big elephant in the room. Corruption has been going on in Ukraine, not for the last 31 years, but for a very, very long time. Let's take it back to Dalmatia in the Slav movement. Okay? Um, it's embedded in the culture. Um, Russia, the former Soviet Union, clearly influenced them into the death of the Ukrainian people, and we can't discount that. Um, uh, Diane, your interview with President Kirchhoff was very telling, the conclusion that you came to. I came to the same conclusion when I sat with him in his dacha. They're just not ready for this. And I left. Morgan Stanley was ready to write a check for $500 million in 1994. And Lamboy did not know what to do with it. That's a problem. And nothing much has changed. Yes, the country has progressed. There's a youth movement. But the mentalitet still is embedded in how people deal and think. And unfortunately, that pragmatism, as I look at it, that Western experience doesn't exist. It's, it's there, but if you have a student who is fortunate enough to go to Harvard and then work in business school, there's very little incentive for them to go back to Ukraine because the infrastructure is not there to implement all the policies and academics um, that they learned in the United States. So there's a fundamental problem of how do you apply Western principles in a world that doesn't understand what that means? Going back to Diane's point with Kirchhoff and 31 years later. Yes, there were a lot of Ukrainians like Miron and, and Levko and, and many others who went, who I think tried, and I give them credibility for enduring. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, the system needs to be completely overhauled, as Ambassador Kupujuk said. And unfortunately, when you listen to Larry Fink at um, BlackRock and Jamie Dimon, who I worked for many, many years ago, 
that J.P. Morgan, um, Ukraine is a case of philanthropy for the next 10 years. However, when their clients pick up their hand and say, we now want to invest, J.P. Morgan and BlackRock will be ready. What did BlackRock do? BlackRock set up a fund. It was seeded with $750 million by one Australian investor to be able to prepare for future investment in Ukraine. That $750 million is going to go in 30 days. How much more money do you need? And investors look for return. Um, I don't know who said earlier today on the panel, I think it was Doug, you said that charity implies cost and investment implies return. We are a business-oriented society. And so having spent some time with Nafta Haza over the last several years when they came to New York with the road shows and wanting to raise capital through bond issuance, well, when the question of collateral came up, well, we can't collateralize. We're state state-owned uh, enterprise. So you're asking me to take the risk while you yield a return and a result, and what do I get for this? This is how bankers and investors and private equity and venture capital thinks. And unfortunately, Ukraine pleads poverty, but on the other hand, they are extremely wealthy because of their corrupt practices. How do you reconcile that as a Western business executive? You can't. You can't. And so fundamental change, as Ambassador Pukukuk said, is paramount. We've been hoping for that for 31 years, but we've been struggling with the concept and identity of Ukraine since we were 12 or 13 years old sitting at the dinner table with our parents listening to the horror stories. Now, how does this translate into the energy sector? It's a process. Um, it translates into agriculture. Agriculture is a net exporter of product. Ukraine is a net energy consumer. They will never export energy. And what's gonna happen when the 8 million people come back to Ukraine and energy demand starts to increase? What's gonna happen? We don't know. We will never know until that day happens. And so, yes, we need to be prepared. But when the SP State Property Fund runs um, auctions and you find out that Kmenitsky, who's a many guard by many people's standards, um, cut a deal with the SPF to buy certain enterprises at pennies on the dollar, how fair is that practice? I know Sinachenko very well. He is being investigated um, uh, shockingly. Um, he was the best guy to lead the ship, but was he clean? We don't know. We don't know. I personally was involved in a potential bidding for UMCC, which was the titanium reserves of Ukraine, the largest titanium mine in the whole of Europe. There were three bids. Um, they all had to get canceled. There was a U.S. investor, there was a foreign investor, and we had a local partner. We were ready to write a check for $300 million. Didn't happen. Why? Because in the 11th hour, there were no security guarantees because of Pintash ownership of the titanium mines near the UFCC. Well, that's a big issue because if you're not going to indemnify the investor who's writing the check for 300 and Pintash does a counter suit, we have a problem. And the same issues exist in the energy sector. So I look at this at a 30,000 foot view and bringing it down to what Rob had said, um, the system needs to get overhauled and it, it needs to change dramatically. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we all agree. Uh, we got five minutes. Yeah, we have a short time for, I value everybody's viewpoints. And as we've mentioned, it's a sobering assessment and there's a lot to do. Uh, and it's a challenge to make a buck in the energy sector currently, more importantly, to bring in that buck to invest. So with that, I'd like to, Adrian, one question. Yeah, we're talking uh, 
Um, we've heard the word sober a lot, so I'll try to kind of intoxicate you. Uh, and it's after lunch, it's a good time for an early drink. Uh, let's talk about the transformative role of the war. Uh, uh, Alina Munju Pipidi, the great scholar of corruption, has said that there are no correlations between any specific policy an anti-corruption court, an anti-corruption special investigative agency, et cetera, et cetera. The only thing that matters in the end, I mean, though all those things matter in the background, the thing that matters is the public's attitude to corruption itself. When the public no longer participates, is unwilling to participate, on the lower levels in minor corruption, they will create also the kind of pressure. And I think we are seeing that the war is bringing a generation that does not tolerate any abuse or misuse of resources. Resources are scanned. People are volunteering. 75% of Ukrainians have given money or volunteered uh, to help the war effort in various ways, charitable IDPs. People are opening up their own homes. Ukraine used to be a low trust society. It is now a society where social bonds are you know, because of the war are, are deepening. And I think that that creates, maybe it won't last, maybe there'll be a return to the norm over time. But I think that creates a window, the window when investment can come in and so on, that there will be a better environment uh, for these things. So I just wanted to, I'm not disagreeing with any of the points that were made, but I do think that this other factor of the public, of public expectations, of public uh, anger, uh, and, and I think of public, activism the public is engaged you have to be engaged if your city has been or your you know suburb has been wiped out you have to in addition to what the state does for you you have to be engaged you're engaged and you know you're putting in your own time your own resources it's not just the government's going to do it for us it take it creates a different attitude there is a, a i think a deeper sense of ownership and so i just wanted to add that into the mix yeah I, thanks I, 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 yeah, we do actually have one question over there Um, thank you. I'm kind of a bit I just want to rewind the corruption point for all panelists. I'm from Kiev originally. I came here in 1994. Until 1991, when the Soviet Union was disintegrated, the original contract was doomed to failure because Crimea was keeping Russian Navy forces inside. It was kind of a very strange separation. Ukraine faced two challenges. One was absolute agency from Russia that was like to my personal calculation, at least 40% of people who were in ministers were actually, I'm sorry to say, Russian agents. And another side in Ukraine was like Western Ukraine who was pulled apart, was trying to rebuild new world and financial from West. So speaking of corruption, it's not very common corruption in, in Ukraine as a country. It, it is, as a matter of fact, of course. But I do believe that whatever tragedy happened right now actually probably will put an end to this. And of course, it's going to be turbulence for a while, but I would never define Ukraine as a classical corruption definition. So all situations that they end faced, and you mentioned, and look, I have a software business since 2001, which all programmers in Ukraine and business is American. So we never face this because the business is clean. You do programmers, not a big deal. So when it comes to larger money, everything pull apart between Russian influence, who's bribing a lot, who's paying a lot of money, and between West, who's trying to do the best in their own way. So I would actually add this factor when anytime you bring corruption in Ukraine, it's not any other country. And by the way, in America, a lot of corruption as well. So. I actually wanted to follow up on what Adrian said. Ben, uh, Bob, I, I think you hear me. Uh, but I think, man, what the problem is with, with the way you've been describing, and the war is cleaning that out, and we haven't talked about it, is what Ariel Cohen at energy conferences we've had has always talked about, and that is the Russian conference. If Bahurians, Babakovs, there are guys. You, you always, we always talk about our oligarchs. And in fact, someone uh, said nice things about this, just like that he's still making things wrong. The fact is, we always know our oligarchs, but what we don't know is the Russian nationals who've been, who worked in Ukraine for 30 years, hiding, 
never took on citizenship. They didn't take on a political role. They didn't buy media. But what they did do is they ran the energy business. And that's what was blocking a lot of people. And what Adrian is trying to say, it's not just that the nation is feeling that way, but in some ways, even those, uh, those characters, once Russia has been no longer can play a role in gay, the Russians can't play a role. A lot of those Russian uncles will stay home. And that may change the dynamic in Ukraine. That's my I, I, I agree with that. I mean, the energy sector in Ukraine is probably the most corrupt. Yeah. For the reason you just stated. Right. My words about corruption were not to criticize the Ukrainian people. Right. I'm talking specifically about the energy sector. There was a moment when Secretary Perry was in Kiev with Michael Weiser where that could have shifted. Right. Unfortunately, the scandal yeah. that ensued destroyed that hope. Yes. That was our only hope. And so my comments, hey, to your point, Adrian, you know, are not directed toward the Ukrainian people, but toward the energy sector. Oh, it's, right. it's dirty. Not just in Ukraine, but everywhere on the face of the planet. Which is why I'm very happy we're going to go on to the next two sections that don't have that same problem. <laughs> can I can I add uh, something to that? Uh, the energy sector in all Eastern European countries has been a conduit for penetration by Russian interest and uh, promoting of strategic corruption, and you can see this in Bulgaria, you can see this in in Moldova, you can see this in other countries as well. So it's a mechanism of penetrating the most powerful sector, the one that provides can provide a lot of money to pay to different uh, people to promote Russian interests. Um, and it, it's very easy and it's cheap because it also makes money to these people as well. So the question is, how do you dismantle this? The war in Ukraine, of course, is going to cut off this connection with Russian individuals and Russian energy um, um, uh, operatives that have penetrated the sector, but it exists as well in other places. And we have not come to a uh, scheme, to a recipe of how to get rid of it, uh, because it is going to continue influencing Ukraine and other countries and the energy sector is so interconnected. Uh, we say Ukraine doesn't sell energy, but Ukraine does export, did export and, uh, electricity to, to Western Europe uh, for, for actually until recently. And now it's negotiating new deals probably with Czech Republic and Romania and uh, to export also electricity to Moldova. So this is an interconnected sector. It is a European sector. Ukraine may not be a member of the European Union, but it's a member of the energy community. Yes. And all these, um, and uh, all these uh, rules of operating this sector, they must be applied as soon as possible, regardless of, of what is happening on the front lines, regardless of, of where Ukraine is at the moment with very heavily impacted um, uh, energy sector by, by the war. This needs to go forward because if it doesn't, as as uh, our panelists are saying, and I completely agree with with Rob and with Miron, uh, this is not going to move forward. The ownership, the privatization, the system of accountability, the system of transparency of the sector. This is, I think, is the only way to get rid of uh, corrupt, uh, subversive for subversive Russian influence in the energy sector of any country in Eastern Europe. Margarita, I agree with you, and I know we need to close the panel. Uh, I do think that connectivity to the European energy grid is saving, is a reforming tendency. I think the lack of transit of Russian gas through Ukraine, although it will hurt the state budget, will clean up the energy sector because nobody's going to suck money off of the grid anymore, off of the tube anymore. I think that the need for investment, as everyone said, will require wealthy Ukrainians, oligarchs or not, to play clean. Otherwise, they're not going to get any financing or money. Mm -hmm. So I think all that is indeed positive. But with that, we do need to think, and maybe the last question i just like to raise, Rob, if you're still there. So in a transitioning economy in the energy sector with potentially positive developments, where should the investment go? Very good. And Bob is the guy. 
formerly, where would you invest? Where would you tell people to put the money in? Are we talking upstream? Are we talking renewables? Well, I mean, it's, it, you, it's a portfolio, right? Uh, clearly, I, I, I see, based on my background, and I apologize to the balance of the uh, people in the room, the, the opportunity set, the near-term opportunity set for, that would benefit Ukraine would be the development of existing assets. Uh, the, the, uh, the gas portfolio has not been uh, developed properly and uh, with any real discipline, uh, with no view toward economics. So from a, if, if I'm speaking to the service providers and I'm speaking to the EMP companies that would go to Ukraine, it's focusing on uh, the gas portfolio uh, that Uber gas production has. Uh, that will have immediate impact uh, within the portfolio. That I, I, the, the war is something I view as a real good hard reset. And I agree with Adrian. Uh, what is being created now, he, he's talking about the, basically the allowance uh, of corruption uh, in, in the past, not certainly not now. Uh, it was a, a general attitude that people had and that attitude has changed. And I can say as, as an outsider, not being a Ukrainian, but being there for 20 years, when I look at all of you here in the room, Historically, you were a lot more patriotic and, and had more of an identification with Ukraine than Ukrainians did. When Russia invaded in 2014, there basically Ukraine found its footing with regard to I'm a Ukrainian versus I'm not. And now, well, God damn it, everyone's a Ukrainian, even people here in Texas are Ukrainians. And um what what Adrian is alluding to is is that this generation now is is Ukraine's great generation, much like my grandfather from World War II. This is a generation that will put up with nothing, and so when it when it comes to developing the resources of Ukraine and and the, re, the removal of corruption, I think it's very important that companies come in and, and focus on the existing portfolio that's there. That will have an immediate impact. That immediate impact showing success early will allow for more difficult decisions like the breakup of the state enterprises that shouldn't exist. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's kind of where I would put them. It's a bit of a ramble, I apologize, but there's been a lot of really good comments being made here. And I, I wanted to basically thank people for making those comments. Well, I think we need to wrap this up. Um, you're done, you're, I that? thank all that's of you. <laughs> I want to throw out one thing. When I hear you talking about energy, promise line. It, it, the same thing goes with cement. The same thing goes with steel. The same thing goes with all of those materials, the material, commodity materials that are going to be needed to reconstruct them. If they don't get their hand, the head wrapped around how to control the, the pricing of all those things, let alone liquid ash. That's true. That's what it is. Uh, Bob, I don't know if you're still on. Andrea, is the Bob still on? I'm here. I'm here. I just want to uh, thank you because I remember how uh, how uh, good and generous you were in terms of uh, helping us with the energy dialogues. Um, it was because you were really set on, on creating a domestic uh, energy uh, situation for us. And, uh, and uh, you always felt that the so Ukrainians could develop their own uh, natural gas capabilities, their own oil capabilities. And the fact is that uh, I'm hoping that someday people like you come back to Ukraine and uh, and uh, and, uh, and reinvest and, uh, and reconnect with us because you were extremely valuable at the time you were there. And I think that the thing about what you mentioned about big marriage. Uh, and I think that you were instrumental in what could have been a very interesting situation about three years ago. So uh, again, 
Bob, I just want to thank in front of everybody. Thank you for all the effort you've had. That's very kind of you. Thank you. And again, thank you to the rest of the panel. Um, as always. We now move on, and I don't want to say this, uh, I, I jest, but uh, we move on to two, two sections that I didn't think I would say, but they're the positive sections in Angus. I think in military industrial terms, I think the Ukrainians, the MacGyvers that they are, are inventing weaponry as we speak. And so I think at some point in five, 10 years, they're going to be the arms dealers of the world. Uh, and the final one, which is high tech or the digitization, I think the Ukrainians have been there a long, long time. So the next two sections are going to be a lot more positive <laughs> than this last one about uh, energy and all the uh, C word that we've been using. So, so anyway, uh, with that, I'm going to pass it very quickly to the fourth section leader, Nicola Hitzkian, um, DC director of Cruiser and the discussants, um, someone who just wowed everybody at the security dialogue, Mr. Ivan Vinnik and, um, and John, um, and John, oh, is he on? Yeah, he is. He is, okay. And Vance, Vance. And Vance, and Vance uh, Sergei, yes? Yes. Advance on. Yeah. Okay, both of them are. Okay, folks. Go more positive. Put a more positive uh, uh, section. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mikhail Anskyan. I'm the director of the DC office uh, for the Center for U.S. Ukrainian Relations. And uh, because of my location, I wound up getting involved in various conferences regarding the Ukrainian military industrial complex. And, uh, handing uh, Ukraine uh, the weapons that it needs. So I've been designated as the person to run this panel. Um, the military, Ukrainian military industry um, and Ukrainian military production is something that's going on right now. And it's being used right now. Ukrainian weapons are being produced today and they're going on the battlefield tomorrow. And we know from news reports that these weapons are very effective. Uh, so this is a unique panel. Um, we're talking about rebuilding Ukraine. Uh, I was at a conference a few weeks ago. Uh, Lev Holobets was there and uh, a young uh, uh, member of parliament, uh, Helena Yanshenko, spoke about it. We're not talking about reconstruction of Ukraine. We're talking about recovery, recovery of Ukraine. Because we don't want to reconstruct the post-Soviet Ukraine. We want to build a new Ukraine. And uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Ukraine and we met with uh, uh, security officials and all of them referred to this war as Ukraine's war for independence. And that's uh, across the board. That's what they see this war like. And uh, this jives with uh, the comments like Adrian talked about that Ukrainian society is changing. Um, with regard to military industry, uh, some of the, our earlier uh, speakers, Ambassador Pupaduk, uh, Diane Francis mentioned uh, various uh, outcomes of the war in Ukraine. And whatever the outcome is, um, a robust Ukrainian military industry is very important for the protection of the population, for the protection of security. Um, military officials, security officials, a few weeks ago, they were telling us that they see the war the soonest that this war would end would probably be in the fall of 2024. So that's about a year and a half. And that was a um, optimistic uh, assessment. So uh, this situation is going to last uh, for a very long time. Um, good examples for Ukraine, uh, countries that were in similar situations, uh, that Ukraine is in uh, earlier. This is the country of Israel. It's the country of South Korea. And the way they secured their uh, uh, security was by building a robust military industrial complex. They build their own weapons. They supply their own uh, military with their own weapons. And um, that's the way they stay safe and free. Another good example is Turkey, which is on the front line, which is on the periphery of, of NATO, and they were able to use uh, 
uh, various uh, uh, tools such as offsets to uh, build up their industry. This is another good example. Uh, in any case, Ukraine inherited a significant military industry from uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, during the Cold War, Ukraine was known as the brains of the USSR. You had very strong engineering schools, you had very strong design bureaus there, and Ukraine inherited all of that. And some of these uh, legacy uh, uh, factories or, or enterprises, such as the Luch enterprise, produced uh, uh, phenomenal weapons like the Neptune missile, which sunk the Moskva a year ago. They also produce a a multiple rocket launcher called the Vilha, which has a 300 kilometer range, which is close to an analog to the HIMARS that, the, uh, that uh, Ukraine received from, from the US. They also produce an uh, anti-tank weapon, the Sturna, which uh, showed itself very good. Probably most of the tank killers in Ukraine were due to the Sturna than uh, to the jam uh, uh, or the end. Um, also, with regard to drone technology, very innovative. Uh, we even see a few, uh, a few days ago, there was a sea drone attack against the military port in uh, Sevastopol, and it was successful. Okay, whoever saw the videotapes of that uh, attack, there were huge explosions along the pier where the, where the military um, 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 ships are. Uh, and this was, who, who talked about sea drones uh, before this war? Nobody. Okay, so this is an innovative tactic and it's an innovative weapon. Um, and a lot of these drones that the Ukrainians are using are actually being produced not by state enterprises, but by, uh, by small companies. Okay, and these companies need the investments to be able to mass produce these weapons. In artillery, there are co-production projects already in place and, and producing uh, munitions in Eastern Europe. These are co-production pro uh, uh, projects with Ukrainian private industry, Ukrainian state-owned industry, and Eastern European co uh, companies. Uh, also, a, uh, a, a very successful weapon system, the Bogdan, self-propelled artillery um, uh, howitzer, um, uh, which was the weapon that was used to free Snake Island. Okay, this is produced by a private Ukrainian firm and um, also a successful weapon system. In the IT, in the tech, you know, Ukraine also is on the cutting edge, especially robotics. We'll be talking about that later uh, uh, during this session. And, um, but this industry needs to recover, okay? Uh, as I said, there's co-production pro projects right now in Eastern Europe with Ukrainian companies. Uh, I've been at meetings where uh, members, uh, the leadership of various Ukrainian companies uh, are saying they are producing weapons in Western Ukraine in hardened areas, and that Western investors should not be that afraid that it's a war zone. Uh, they were saying basically these facilities were all built to withstand nuclear nuclear uh, uh, war back in the Soviet Union. So obviously uh, this uh, industry needs improvement. It needs to be get it needs to get onto uh, 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 mass uh, a footing where these products could be mass produced, not only for Ukraine but for the whole region. Uh, this is a region of instability. We see that we've gone into a uh, a uh, time in history where you have Western democracies versus uh, totalitarian countries, China, uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea. And that's not going to go away because the Chinese want to eat our lunch. And they're allied with all these other countries. Very much so, um, and this war showed that there is a deficit in various uh, uh, in munitions and in other weapons, there's just not enough. There's a huge demand for weaponry right now. And the Ukrainian industry can play a key role in this. To talk about the Ukrainian industry, we have uh, probably the best people we could line up are, um, first I'd like to introduce Ivan Vinnik. He's a former member of the Ukrainian uh, uh, Supreme Rada. And he was a uh, 
member of the, actually in the leadership of the Rada Committee on National Security and Defense. And he dealt with uh, a lot of issues of supplying Ukrainian weapons. This is from, 19, uh, from 2014 to 2019. Uh, right now, he is the uh, uh, deputy uh, head of the Ukrainian, uh, let me get this uh, name down exactly, the National Association of Defense Industry Manufacturers. And, um, and he's been doing work here in Ukraine, in the United States, uh, in on these issues to find support for these various uh, projects which are ongoing right now. Uh, our second speaker will be Vance Sechuk. He's from KKR Global uh, uh, Institute, and he specializes in defense, aerospace, and industrial uh, technology, and also he's part of KKR Investments. And our uh, lead discussant is John Fall, who will be in our next panel too. Uh, I know John Falk actually cooperated with uh, with Ivan Vindic years ago to get anti-tank weapons into Ukraine when there was a, a, a unwritten embargo against this. Uh, so they were successful then. Uh, John Falk, he has twenty eight years of twenty eight years of experience in representing the U.S defense uh, uh, sector. He's also an adjunct uh, professor in uh, uh, George Washington University in the School of Law. He's a founding member of uh, and president of Vigilant uh, Inc., which is a, a defense uh, company. And in 2014, he was the first person to tell the Ukrainian uh, military delegation where they need to go to be able to get U.S. aid. He pointed the uh, uh, DSCA office to them in 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 uh, in the Pentagon, but that's another story. Um, I would like to uh, pass the microphone off first to Ivan Vinnik, then we'll go Ivan Vinnik, Vance Sechuk, and then uh, John Falk. Ivan, please. Thank you, Makolo, for this introduction. Uh, Certainly, uh, the war conflict is a kind of opportunity for the defense industry. Because the defense industry received this necessary momentum, received necessary orders, received a lot of investment, government investment, first of all, in form of uh, defense contracts. And that's what's happening in Ukraine, basically, right now. And uh, if we say, who is doing the job? Uh, basically, Ukrainian defense industry is still comprised of state-owned factories, recent so-called enterprise of Parabolon Prom, which has not yet been yet privatized. And this is, of course, a sad story of Ukraine and another probably source of corruption, as we frequently discussed today. Uh, another branch is a proud privately owned factories and companies who its own efforts decided to produce weapons. This is highly regulated and highly dependable on the government favor industry, because uh, you cannot sell weapons to the open market, especially in Ukraine. Because in Ukraine, you cannot freely export weapons uh, on uh, foreign markets. You have to receive a special license, and we have only seven companies in Ukraine who has that license. Uh, so anything you would like to export uh, outside of Ukraine, you have to do through seven state-owned companies. And this is, of course, another uh, source of uh, inefficiency, at least, which uh, certainly impacts the investments into the branch. Talking about uh, investments which has recently been done after the war break up, uh, we are talking primarily about private investments. And uh, I should say that those investments were driven by the needs what I mean, for example, that the company who produced uh, Hovitzer Bahdana, this is a uh, self-propelled Hovitzer of Ukrainian design, which successfully was deployed during the liberation of Snake Island, is produced by a Ukrainian company and it was produced in Kramatorsk. This is a city which could be considered as a gray zone right now because uh, almost on daily basis it's being shelled or sales are hitting the local production and residential areas. That's why the uh, company who produced Bogdan is a relocated their production facilities. 
Western or Western Ukraine, and of course, that sort of prelocation to the title is significant amount of investments in this, both in construction efforts and building new equipment and, and so on and so forth. Another example is, of course, Turkish company Bicard, the producer of UAV Bayraktar. They also announced that they're going to set up a factory in Ukraine. But that effort, investment effort, is also driven by the need because, of, according to the Ukrainian law, uh, they have to fulfill and stay by their offset obligations. So Ukraine was and paid a significant amount of money to import UAVs from Turkey. So Turkey right now is responsible to basically for the same amount to be reinvested back in Ukraine. So uh, the industry remains heavily regulated in Ukraine, uh, a lot of bureaucracy behind. So, of course, this is something called limits investments. This is a negative part of the story. The positive part, of course, uh, of the story that initially, when the war broke up, there was multiple missile strikes on Ukrainian defense infrastructure, but they could not tell that they were too efficient. Russians, they targeted primarily state-owned factories. But the truth is that the most sophisticated things what Ukrainian defense industry produced are built by private companies. Mm -hmm. And most of the private companies um, basically were not either hit or had managed to relocate the production facilities in safe distance from the front lines. Uh, and as of now, of course, Ukraine has their defense industry, which could basically to do it, do their job. What kind of risks on the way? Certainly, if uh, those types of government investments and uh, kind of defense contracts continue, Ukrainian industry will be thriving for some time. But uh, we don't know what will be end game uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we don't know how successful going to be counteroffensive. We don't know how long Western partners going to be supporting Ukraine. Why uh, that concerns us? Because it's not a secret anymore that Ukrainian state budget is dependent on uh, foreign donations. We received up to 70% 70 70 of, of the revenues from foreign donors. And of course, if the policy towards Ukraine somehow changes, uh, Ukraine's of social and defense spending will be impacted. Uh, the sovereign, sovereign risks are so high that any any type of investors who is justifying investments in Ukraine will have we will have to take into consideration the situation as government finance and dependency on uh, foreign aid and other factors which don't make Ukraine economically truly and financially truly independent. This is uh, what that what we are facing right now in Ukraine. Talking about our efforts to build. Uh, sophisticated weapons like uh, anti-vessel uh, missile Neptun, which sank uh, cruiser Moskva, or when we are talking about sophisticated uh, missiles, which are able to reach the distances up to 200-300 kilometers, which we call the car, we are facing difficulties, of course, to get components, sophisticated components to build weapons. We are talking about microchips, special uh, sensors, which uh, we require to build uh, guiding system, homing systems. Um, usually we ask those uh, components from our partners and allies like United States or European countries, but the lead time, lead time for the deliveries of the components sometimes uh, is exceeding 12 months. And of course, we don't have some, so, much, so much time. So I would claim that we, would like, we, we can build a missile Neptune uh, which was originally designed to strike uh, sea targets. We can redesign that missile to strike land targets. And that would be a good thing for Ukraine because that will be more or less like a similar missile, like Russian caliber or uh, United States built Tomahawk, maybe with a little bit uh, shorter range, but we could reach about 400, 600 kilometers. And this is something which could be essentially for Ukraine to build the necessary negotiation positions with Russia. Because if you if Ukraine is able to uh, do the same thing to Russia, to Russia uh, what they do for Ukraine, and if it can do it with Ukrainian built weapons, so meaning if they don't put any geopolitical weapons on the table, we, could, we build the weapons ourselves, we can deploy it in the way we want. Because it's uh, according to our national interests, right? So 
My point is, if you create this provider the components, which we essentially need to build sophisticated weapons, we can build a lot of sophisticated things in the country, domestically. And this is something which we try to address as association right now. Because if the United States is reluctant to provide something which they believe would jeopardize them, and geopolitical standings, uh, like other camps, long-range missiles, well, it could be better off getting necessary microchips to redesign home and power locally made missiles to do the same job. So that's what we are working right now. Talking about munition and shells production uh, and artillery munition production. Of course, we are still missing many chemical components like propellants, like explosives, which we cannot build uh, objectively in Ukraine. Because we can and we do build right now productions for uh, building the uh, shell body, I mean metal shell body. We can do cartridge for artillery munitions. But in terms of chemicals, like propellants or explosives, this is something what we have to source from abroad. And there is a huge deficit for those type of chemistry in the world right now. That's why we are reaching out to United States companies to try and uh, get necessary support, but everybody is so busy with that type of uh, markets right now. Uh, defense items and armament mar um, ar markets in the world are thriving right now. So everybody is so busy with the demand and quite complicated. That's why our efforts were always focused to find necessary diplomatic and political help to get to get to, to provide us as Ukrainian manufacturers the access to some components which are still needs. If, if we have, trust me, we will do a lot of things to help Ukraine uh, to build up a better negotiation position uh, with Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. And uh, up next will be. Uh, Vance Centruk. Uh, Vance, are you online? I am. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, we hear you. Terrific. Well, first, let me say uh, I'm uh, grateful and, and honored by the opportunity to, uh, to be able to participate in the conference and, um, and in particular by this, by this panel. Um, I, I don't disagree with uh, with a word uh, that has been that's been said so far, and I think uh, Mikola, you uh, provided a very comprehensive and compelling uh, and accurate um, assessment of um, some of the opportunities um, as well as some of the challenges that uh, we face right now uh, when we talk about the intersection of the war and questions of um, of the defense industrial base. Um, you know, I think it was said at the outset that this would be a more positive panel. Um, I, I think I'd be cautious about that characterization. I think it's very strange to talk about anything positive in connection to uh, to this war, which is such a terrible um, tragedy. Um, but I do think that we have a responsibility uh, in the face of this uh, unprovoked uh, and illegal um, attack. Uh, by Russia uh, against Ukraine, and actually by extension to the entire West, to the free world, um, to take very seriously um, these defense industrial questions that it raises. Um, I will say at the outset that I, I am, um, on the one hand, I think that the, the war uh, should be a wake-up call uh, across a number of different dimensions. And perhaps in that limited sense, it might be even described as a kind of geopolitical opportunity, um, not just for Ukraine, but for the United States and for the West more broadly. Um, what is concerning is that we are now 15 months in, and I'm not quite sure that that wake up call has quite entirely woken us up yet. You know, the reality of what we're dealing with right now, um, if think if we're going to be uh, very honest uh, with, uh, with ourselves, is that we're in something which increasingly resembles a war of attrition. Um, and you know, you win a war of attrition by outproducing the other side. What worries me is that I do not see yet the seriousness of purpose with respect to the things that we need to be outproducing. So 
you know, this war first and foremost uh, should have been, should be a wake up call about the US defense industrial base, um, about the fact that our defense industrial base um, is inadequate for a high intensity war. Now, you know, we know why this is the case. Um, it is because um, we thought uh, that our leaders thought that we weren't gonna have any more high intensity wars. Um, and our defense industrial base reflects uh, precisely that, that geopolitical assessment from back in the 1990s. Um, the only problem of course, is that for the last several years, uh, long before Vladimir Putin uh, decided that he was going to um, go and try to seize Ukraine. And if he couldn't seize it, then he was going to smash it. Um, the geopolitical assessment had changed. Um, and not really actually with respect to Europe, but first and foremost, with respect actually to the Indo-Pacific and the concern there about the possibility of a great power war, um, a great power war, Western Pacific over Taiwan. The challenge is, again, that when you look at the kinds of things that are required in order to sustain oneself in that kind of conflict, and in particular, the very large number of very small things, the kinds of munitions that you need, of drones, of long range fires, that defense industrial base that we have is not the defense industrial base that we need. So question number one is, you know, the good news um, generally when you have a problem is first actually acknowledging that you have a problem. And Ukraine um, in this respect has been very important because 15 months ago, 18 months ago, um, if you ask who in Washington DC is talking about the inadequacy of our industrial base for munitions, the fact that if you have a war game over the Western Pacific, it often will end with the blue team simply running out of missiles? The answer was very few people. The conversation is now fundamentally shifted. And that is um, a, you know, a, a, a kind of gift that Ukraine and its suffering has given to the United States and given to the West. Now, there is, I think, an evolving policy debate about how do we deal with that? Um, and there are some moves that are in the right direction that involve, for example, multi-year procurement of munitions, as opposed to treating them as a one-off and a bill payer. Um, but I think that we're still very far away from where we need to be in terms of that ability to ramp on um, the kinds of systems that we will need. First, to, uh, to be able to re replenish the coffers that are already being um, exhausted and drawn down. Second, uh, to sufficiently arm the Ukrainians for what has the potential to be a, a very long conflict. You know, we obviously all would like the this war to end uh, on successful terms as soon as possible. But I think, um, as was said previously um, by another speaker, we have to be prepared for the possibility that this goes on for a long time. And then third, to be able to have the surge capacity, um, to be able to have credible deterrence, not just in the Euro-Atlantic theater, but in the Indo-Pacific theater as well. Thanks. Second, I think that this is also, um, it should be a wake up call about the character of war itself. Right? One of the things that happens when you have a conflict like this is that it's an opportunity um, for, uh, for people to study and to learn and also to test capabilities and discover whether or not uh, they work or how they can be perfected or what their flaws are. So in this respect as well, you know, when the United States and the Europeans are providing weapons to the Ukrainians, I think it's important for us to recognize that this is not simply some sort of gift. You know, sometimes this is portrayed, I think, by, by people who are uh, critical of the policy um, and even by people who are supportive of the policy as though this is, you know, an act of, of, an act of charity. The reality is that the United States has a tremendous interest in being able to uh, get um, in thoughtful ways, military capabilities into the hands of our Ukrainian partners so that we can actually also assess what works, what needs to work better and to learn from this conflict. 
right? That's one of those larger um, lessons from, from history and particularly from military history, uh, which is that when a conflict like this happens, it's very, very important to be paying very close attention to it. If you think back to uh, the Middle East War in 1973, you know, the United States Army um, paid a lot of attention to the 1973 war. Um, on the one hand, uh, you had Soviet weapons that were being used uh, by the Arab countries, uh, and you had predominantly American weapons that were being used by the Israelis. And that was a high intensity war. That was a very short war by comparison, but that was a high intensity war. And it was precisely by studying the lessons very carefully of uh, that Middle East war in 1973, October 1973, that U.S. military doctrine uh, dramatically changed and evolved and became much more sophisticated. Um, and so I think that we also have an important opportunity in this respect as well to be um, on the side of the West, paying very close attention to what's happening in Ukraine, to thinking very carefully about the systems that are there, and then drawing the proper lessons from that so that our capabilities in the West can get better. Lastly, and I think that this is um, a point that, uh, that was already made, but I think it can't be underscored enough. Um, this is also a wake up call about the fact that it's not just gonna be US or European capability, or that defense industrial capability uh, that will be enough. Um, it's also important to be able to find uh, that capability and to build it up among uh, partners uh, and allies um, that are outside the current uh, perimeter. And this is where, as this was pointed out, I think Ukraine is another extraordinary and vital uh, opportunity. Um, because Ukraine, of course, does have enormous defense industrial capability. So, um, the Ukrainians have proven not only to be extraordinarily courageous, but also uh, extraordinarily innovative um, in how they are adapting uh, technology uh, and capabilities in order to deliver effects. Um, and so as I think we look forward, we should be thinking not just about how do we, in my view, recapitalize our own defense industrial base? How do we ensure that the, the conflict in Ukraine um, is um, uh, a, a, a place where the Ukrainian partners can get the capabilities that they need, but that also we can learn from the conflict in order to make those capabilities more effective? But lastly, how do we work with the Ukrainian government to build up the defense industrial uh, potential that already exists in the country. Um, this is, I think, the third leg of the stool. And again, on all of these issues, I think that the, the good news, to the extent that one can even speak of good news, is that um, there's a growing awareness um, of these, uh, these, uh, these imperatives. Um, I think that the, the bad news is that we're still very far away, despite being more than a year into the conflict, from fully seizing what we need to be doing um, and what we should be doing in response to this, this situation. With that, let me stop. Um, I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you, Vance. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Vance, uh, for your words. I would agree with uh, everything that you said. If I had to give a talk, I would give your talk. <laughs> um, our next speaker is uh, John Falk, uh, who, as I mentioned before, has a lot of experience in dealing with Ukraine and with uh, Ukrainian defense uh, needs. Uh, John is our lead discussant. John, take it away. Mute. Mute. My apologies. I thank you and Walter for giving me the honor of participating with this important conference and this panel. And as you gave such a brilliant overview, McCullough, um, there's very little ground yet to cover. Um, and you could not have a greater expert or source than Ivan Vinnick to be giving the audience a excellent assessment of the situation on the ground in Ukraine, the Ukraine political and military industrial complex 
obstacles and I wanted to just augment a couple of items that uh, I'm sorry, we have a little bit of feedback. Hold on, I'm going to mute you and unmute you. Yep, and unmute yourself right now again. One more time, just uh, unmute yourself, John, and let's see it now if there's any feedback. Does that work? Yes. Sorry about that. It was just loud in the hall. So I don't know where um, I may have uh, dropped off, but I wanted to compliment Ivan's assessment of the situation on the ground in Ukraine. And with respect to Vance, I will come back to the comments about wake up calls and gifts in a moment. I had the honor from 2014 to 2019 to be supporting our SOLIC efforts on the ground in Ukraine. And in particular focus was drone warfare, counter drone warfare and electronic warfare and counter UAS. It was through those initiatives where I first had the honor of working with and meeting with Ivan Vinnick and other Supreme Rada members of parliament, such as Alexei Skripnik. And it was through those interactions where we first helped the Ukrainian military understand how to navigate through the US military bureaucracy at the Pentagon namely the Defense Security Cooperation Agency that McCullough had mentioned. And in terms of some top level comments, in terms of the United States, what we saw and which was to this day frustrating about the US defense establishment and the Pentagon continues to be a bit of a holdover of viewing Ukraine as a satellite state of the Soviet Union and a continued paranoia about releasing America's best and greatest technologies and weapons to Ukraine, whether that's through an FMS case or through a direct transfer or direct commercial sale. Having worked through a series of foreign military cases for the benefit of the Ukraine army and for the benefit of the Ukraine National Guard in specific reference to electronic warfare systems, radars and counter UAS systems. There was an unspoken fear or hesitancy within our Pentagon. And that just needs to be accepted um, and and Ivan and I saw that painfully firsthand. I also had the honor of working with Ivan where we went to the White House for Ivan to brief Vice President Biden's chief of staff on the critical needs, the critical requirements that Ukraine had to build and rebuild its military after 2014. And as Vance was talking about wake up calls, I wish our White House and our Pentagon were receiving the wake up calls that Ivan Vinnick and many, many Ukrainian leaders and members of parliament were trying to give to the United States in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017. And when I look at the current estimates of $32.5 billion of US military assistance to Ukraine, in my humble judgment, if the United States had contributed a fraction of that amount back in 2015, 2016, 2017, with systems that would have deterred the frontal assault of Ukraine in a more decisive fashion, we may not even be having this discussion today. And I wanted to note that 
And McCullough was a part of, of supporting a delegation that had come to Washington of, of members of, of parliament, including Alexei Skripnik and the former deputy prime minister, Ivana Klimpush. And I had organized a meeting with then former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Dick Luger. And the discussion that Luger provided was, was quite amazing in terms of educating these Ukrainian <clears throat> representatives about the 1994 Budapest Memorandum and the absolute co commitment in the mind of former chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Luger, that they recognized that Ukraine was being asked to give up its 6,600 nuclear warheads as a part of nuclear deterrence, which were Ukraine's great insurance policies against larger Russia. And it was a very interesting and poignant moment in my view, because while I believe in wake up calls, I also believe in history and trying to avoid history repeating itself. And in, in my uh, view, today, America needs to be unleashing this support, unclogging the logistics, using whatever means are possible to get these committed resources into the hands of the frontline Ukrainian military. And with that, I will, I will get off of my uh, soapbox relative to those issues, but a couple of important critical facts. The ambassador mentioned the huge military and, and defense uh, manufacturers existed east of the Dnieper River. And Ivan's the perfect person to speak to this in his, his current capacity. Be mindful that 70 to 75% of the military industrial complex of the Soviet Union was in Ukraine. The gray matter is in Ukraine. The great innovation is in Ukraine. And also not mentioned and needs to be recognized that from 2015 to 2019, Russia was consistently sending huge convoys into Eastern Ukraine to certain defense manufacturing facilities with the express purpose of taking every piece of gear and manufacturing element down to the, the things riveted to the floor back to Russia. There is no doubt that of all of the industrial sectors of Ukraine, the military complex, the military defense industry is spectacular. It's brilliant. What I have seen since 2014, especially in the unmanned systems area, and I work with retired admirals and generals that are attached to SOCOM, attached to JSOC, all of our soft community, they recognize that the innovation and ingenuity and persistence of the Ukraine military are redefining the battlefield as we speak. One perfect example of that is back in 2015, some of the technologists with Alexei Skripnik's team at Elix in Lviv had come up with an unmanned ground vehicle that was leading edge, that's now on the battlefield. Some of his technologists were also already coming to grips with the fact that many of the American made drone systems that were being given to Ukraine for deployment were being treated like toys by the Russians in terms of their electronic warfare systems, their, their jamming tools, their counter drone systems. And the American contributed drones were useless. The innovators at Elix and in other companies like Roveneers came up with 
drones that could operate in GPS denied environments and be able to withstand those Russian electronic assaults. That kind of innovation and adaptation on the fly in the battlefield, there is no doubt in my mind that this conflict is providing tremendous, tremendous information that will reshape active, intense conflicts of this kind. And with that, I will uh, pass the baton back to our leader, McCullough. Thank you, John, for your words. And uh, it's good to see you. Um, so with that, um, just two comments, and then I'll open up the, uh, the floor uh, to our audience. Um, one comment is the United States and Western countries are depleting their stocks in supplying Ukraine. And my question is, why hasn't the Defense Production Act been invoked? Okay. We invoked it to produce uh, respirators uh, during the uh, pandemic. Um, why aren't we invoking it now? It's number one. Number two, what happened to Lend-Lease? Where did that go? That was passed. There's a pile of money out there that Congress has uh, uh, signed. There's 18 months to spend it. And how much of that has been uh, spent on helping Ukraine? Um, I was at one gathering where a person from the State Department basically said, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to implement this. And that's problematic. So um, audience, loud. So I'm going to speak loudly here. Um, and thank you for the presentation. It's all three very insightful. Uh, and and uh, my question is, again, how can we drive more immediate cooperation between the, uh, how can we drive more immediate cooperation between the United States and, and our needs in the defense sector? And, and allow me just to go out on a limb and say one of them, one of those needs is pure labor uh, to, uh, to start converting more production. Um, there's a lack of labor in certain locations, certain places. And secondly, um, with the last presentation, just the, the, the thought of the innovation ingenuity in Ukraine and potential military based type investment, you know what I'm just trying to build a value proposition here of what can we do now that actually pays dividends as well, in addition to on the battlefield. Hopefully that question makes sense. Thank you for your question. First of all, we should admit uh, that the consumption of uh, munition, for example, any type of military items in Ukraine is exceeding uh, the capacities of production anywhere in the world. Uh, second point, most of the stocks are being depleted right now, but uh, only within those countries which were able to provide weapons to Ukraine. For example, there are allies of the United States which are reluctant to provide weapons to Ukraine, and for example, South Korea, right? And uh, that you can find some other countries which have uh, Soviet type of weapons, of Soviet type of ammunition, artillery ammunition available, which is scarce in Ukraine, huge deficit, and we, we will be glad to receive those. However, those countries are not providing. So uh, one thing what could be immediately uh, change the situation in the battlefield, probably, uh, if we somehow, as a part of Ukraine and the United States, would facilitate those types of transfers officially or unofficially. For example, Russia has recently made a deal with Iran uh, to deliver 300,000 of uh, artillery ammunition. This is a huge quantity considering the type of war conventional battlefield that we are facing in Ukraine right now. We have huge deficit for mortar mines. Uh, and this is probably something which could be wrapped up pretty quickly in the United States too, because it's a pretty simple munition. You don't need sophisticated equipment to build a mortar mine. Uh, we have a financial problem too. In spite of the fact that Ukraine is being provided up to 70% of budget spendings, those spendings 
Uh, I mean, I'm talking about uh, financial aid of Western countries. Those spendings are only isolated for social needs. We cannot take money of which United States, European Union provide us on a monthly basis and uh, designate those money for military needs. And this is a huge matter because uh, our budget spendings are comprised primarily, more than 50% of total spendings we spend for defense uh, means, but those we can only amass for our taxation process and domestic taxation taxation process, or we can borrow. But it's pretty, it's pretty hard, hard to borrow money for Ukraine right now. Uh, financial world is pretty pragmatic. They don't accept sentiments that we should help Ukraine. They just simply count. Uh, they just simply count the premium for risk. Pretty simple. Uh, and and uh, we are not offended uh, of those principles. It's fine. Uh, we just have to make sure if uh, Ukraine is something which defines geopolitical map of the future world, we should take a political decision to help Ukraine. That if, if we cannot provide necessary amounts of weapons. And due to objective reasons, because the absent but still celebrated of factories are not running fast enough, or at least in the coming three to six months. Yes, let's find funds, money funds for Ukraine. Let's try to engage more Eastern European countries who can produce right now at a high price. Bulgaria, for example, Poland, Romania. There are a bunch of private producers who can produce Soviet type munitions. Yes, they do charge pretty high prices right now because they're business people and they try to earn money. But if, if there is a possibility to buy, and if uh, it's a stake uh, future of Ukraine, future of Ukrainian nation, because just imagine if Ukraine fails, Russia will simply do homicide in Ukraine. So, so, we are not talking about war between two presidents, President Zelensky or uh, President Putin. We are talking about war between two nations. 85% of Russian people support continuing war in Ukraine. They truly believe that they're fighting some sort of Nazis, right? And of course, the Ukrainian 95% recent all Ukrainians wish to continue because of different reasons. Some wish to revenge, some wish to liberate territories, repatriations, the period of Ukraine. I mean, we are talking about two huge nations, above 40 million of Ukrainians and above 100 million of Russians would like to continue. So this is an existential thing. This is not about money anymore. That's why a bunch of things could be done. And those things should be somehow linked or designated for the battlefield, for successful conventional battle, battlefield. That's what we're asking for. Thank you. So um, maybe just a, a, a quick, uh, a few comments. Um, so uh, the question was asked about uh, the Defense Production Act, um, which I think is an excellent question um, because you're absolutely right. Uh, for the last few years, we've used the Defense Production Act uh, for many things, uh, just not defense or defense production. Um, but to be fair, um, in actually just the, the last few months, um, we actually have had some other uses of the Defense Production Act, uh, which are closer to the mark. Um, so the Defense Production Act, for example, has been used uh, to uh, bolster uh, production of uh, printed circuit boards, PCBs. PCBs are, you know, uh, a few levels up from uh, microchips, but they are part of the key uh, defense electronics that you will find in any uh, weapon system, any military piece of equipment. Big challenge that we have with PCBs is that in that industry uh, moved overwhelmingly overseas. It moved overwhelmingly to Asia. Uh, generally speaking, it's probably not a great idea uh, if you um, want to uh, have a defense industry for it to become uh, dependent on its core uh, defense electronics. Um, on uh, a place like China. Um, so bolstering the US domestic production capability around PCBs, um, around printed circuit boards is very important. More recently, and this is I think actually a far more important example and a, a, a more encouraging one, and also an important response um, to, you know, again, those who say, well, you know, what's happening in Ukraine is, is uh, hurting our defense readiness or it's diminishing our ability to be able to have deterrence in other theaters. So uh, just a few uh, days ago, um, mid-month, um, there was a $215 million uh, grant 
uh, to a company called Aerojet Rocketdyne. Um, Aerojet Rocketdyne is one of the two companies left in the United States um, that manufactures uh, the rocket motors um, that go onto any number of key systems, um, like the HIMARS, like the Gimlers, but also uh, many, many other systems as well. Um, and this was funding that came uh, via the Defense Production Act, but the actual appropriation um, was funded by the Ukraine uh, Supplemental Appropriations Act. And so in this case, um, this is money which uh, falls from that Ukraine Supplemental Appropriations, but what it's gonna go towards is uh, bolstering the production capability in places like uh, Camden, uh, Arkansas and Huntsville, Alabama, to be able to make what is one of the absolutely crucial defense industrial inputs uh, that is needed uh, not only uh, for weapons going to Ukraine, uh, but for bolstering uh, the U.S. arsenal uh, more broadly. Um, we need to be doing a lot more of this. Right? It, it's an opportunity for us to be reinvesting um, in a very, very significant way in our own defense industrial base. Um, some of this can come, I think actually the Ukraine supplemental is an appropriate place to be drawing some funds. Um, but I think we also have to look beyond that. You know, some of it is providing long-term um, assured numbers around key systems so that the supply chains can start to scale up. Some of it is also funding uh, for workforce and workforce development, because one of the key challenges that we also have is in a number of different areas of defense, whether it's uh, shipbuilding or munitions, um, it's hard to actually just find uh, skilled labor uh, to be able to do these jobs. Um, in some cases, these are jobs uh, that are not only uh, require um, uh, technical proficiency, uh, they also require security clearance. Um, and so there needs to be a lot of work uh, on that front as well. Lastly, I, I really think, you know, we need to shift the conversation from where we've been, which, you know, all too often for the last 15 months entails, you know, the Ukrainians um, asking for a capability, uh, the United States, you know, dragging its feet and having a very anguished debate about whether or not this is gonna be escalatory explaining all the reasons we can't do it, why it would be too uh, provocative, and then generally going along and providing the capability after which it does not result uh, in massive escalation, but it does bolster Ukrainian capability. Rather than continuing to have that conversation, I, I think instead what we need to be focused on is this question of first, what is it that the Ukrainians need to be able to um, as quickly as possible uh, turn the tide in this war of attrition? Um, and most effectively. Two, what are the capabilities that um, are on the developmental side that it would be beneficial for the United States to be able to get into the fight, not only because it will help the Ukrainians, but also because it will help us understand better um, the capabilities that we are developing and how to refine the development of those systems. Right. And again, this is thinking about Ukraine, not just as an obligation or responsibility, a crisis, but also um, a, 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 a place where we can um, ourselves strengthen our own capabilities, uh, both by deploying forward and by strengthening our own base. Thank you. Thank you. McCullough, McCullough can I uh add a couple of data points there. Very short, because we got to end the session. I'm getting the book over here, so John. Understood. Short answer to your question about the Defense Production Act is that there is no will within this White House or the Pentagon to use it for the bread and butter items that Ukraine needs, which are the munitions. Two, ITAR is the great retardation factor, it's the International Trafficking in Arms Regulations process, which itself is an impediment to quickly getting aid and assistance to Ukraine. Thirdly, is the logistics. And if they authorize the use of our military transports to unclog the delivery of some of the key weapon systems, platforms, to Ukraine, that could facilitate getting those systems to the front line. So 
the question about lend lease, it's a brilliant subject, Macola, but that's going to take a much longer uh, discussion with congressional support to give the Ukrainians the benefit of that very complicated doctrine. Okay, on that, that'll be the last word so that we were running a little bit over time. Uh, I'd like to thank our presenters, uh, Ivan Vinnik, uh, Van Sertruk, and uh, John Falk for a very informative uh, panel. And I hope our guests will come up to our, our, um, our um, speakers and speak with them during the break that we're going to have right now, a coffee break, correct? Uh, yes, you're about that. Thank you, everybody. If we need this, we're going to have a coffee break for about three minutes. The governor is supposed to be uh, in the last session. So we've got, and we want this, this next session uh, as interesting as all the other topics. We can work together. Three minutes and then we have a. I also want to thank all the speakers. Thank you. Hey, Macola. 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 I'll, I'll take I'll take cream I'll take cream in my coffee, Macaulay.